All right. Hey, everybody. Adam and John back with another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. And uh, our guest today is Tim Ensley. And uh, he's he's one of these guys where you see him all over and like it's like man he's the mc and i gotta tell you like when you see tim like right now he, he, we're doing this on zoom so i've got uh you can see him you can see he's got his hat on backwards but when you see him you know he's the mc for the badlands film festival he's got this big old cowboy hat on he's running around on stage throwing stuff at people you know giving away everything under the sun and uh that's one of the things we're going to get into today is like the badlands film festival and like what's the status you know it's usually a big draw at ata and um you know we've enjoyed it i've got my badlands film festival cup here uh with just water tonight uh, it's been a rough weekend so we're in the recovery <laughs> phase um so you'll hear no beers cracking in this one but um so how are you doing tonight tim man i'm good uh literally Went yesterday to my deer camp. Haven't been there in a while. Uh, got a little family deer camp and it poured down rain all day. I put on a rain suit, took the recurve, no camera, just went climbed in the stand and missed a deer, missed a deer <laughs> with the trap belt. I, I feel great. <laughs> so um, I, I know I talked to you about this, like when we were talking on the phone and it's, it's been like a, like a passion project of mine is we've got a, a deer camp in the UP too. And, uh, so is this that family deer camp? Like, so if you go, I think it's on base maps, um, YouTube, they've got this video that Tim did about like this, this deer camp. And I mean, if you have a deer camp, like the, the cinematography or like the way that this is shot, it makes you feel like, you know, this is the exact film that I want to make for, for my camp, for those memories. So you could, I mean, it's well worth going there and, and watching it. Like if you, you know, haven't been to your camp in a while, or you're like, man, I'm really missing it or whatever. Like it's, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing. And I'm not like trying to pump him up and like say, Oh yeah, he does such a great <laughs> job. But like when I watched it, I was like, Holy shit. Like, this is like exactly what I have in my mind for like my camp. So. Well, I can't take any credit for that camp. I, I mean, the film, obviously I, I actually i literally shot that whole film myself just uh around camp i always wanted to do something with that's actually my wife's family's deer camp and, and her family has hunted there for now you know over 60 years and at one time there were you know 20 or 25 family members in that camp and there was no leasing you just had this little plot of land that you owned and they put up you know they put you know some little houses on it some little shack houses and you know a, a fire shed and a cookhouse and then they all just went in there and they stayed for like two weeks and all the land around there was, was, you know, private land or, or, or timber company land. And there was deer camps, literally there still are deer camps, you know, less than a mile on either direction of us. There's, there's deer camps that all, they have like 300 members, but now that all the land's leased, you know, so you have to lease your property you hunt. But back then they all just hunted the same property and you, you know, so, so-and-so knew that, you know, Oh, Joe Bob, he hunted on that part and, and uh, you know, Tom hunted on this part and they ran dogs and rode horses and, and I mean, it was like this huge deal. For two weeks, everybody just moved to deer camp and, uh, you know, my wife talked about, you know, when she was a kid, they had Thanksgiving at deer camp. They had, you know, one year they had Christmas at deer camp. All the family was there and, and uh, now there's just me and her and her dad. That's all that's left and and so, yeah, it was kind of cool. I, when I started hunting there, it was like my first real hunting experience was, you know, hunting at her family's deer camp. And uh, and there were still, you know, six or seven people there then. So it was still kind of like a camp and and uh, it, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. And I just, it's one of those things, you know, I don't go there to kill big, big deer like the film says, you know, it's not uh, once I, you know, got kind of into the industry and got in a position where I could go with these other places and really have an opportunity to hunt you know big whitetail and other other places i i use the deer camp for more place just you know i go hang out relax chill just go get a get a deer stand if if we need camp meat you know it's a go shoot a doe hanging on the skinner rack a lot of times i'm there by myself just build a fire and cook breakfast and and it's just my kind of my chill spots you know and and uh I just hope it's always in the family. It's been there for years and years and years, and I don't ever want to lose it. You know, I want, I want us always to have that place because it's so special to her family. And I said it's not, it's not a place you're going to go kill a 
150 you're, you're probably not going to see a, you're not probably not even going to see a, a hundred inch deer you know um but it's just uh it's just a special place you know and that's that's what i wanted to portray in the film was that it was so special to her family and and to me like i said the first first time i really had a hunting experience was right there and so uh, let's talk about that a little bit you know we usually get the the history on you know your hunting style and like how you got into hunting and it sounds like your wife was a big influence in that yeah she 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 hunted a little bit not much but you know i mean i come from a big rodeo background my dad didn't hunt and uh i didn't hunt i mean we were straight up rodeo people i mean we were we were either at a rodeo or we were practicing to go to a rodeo or i mean that was my whole life from the time I mean, there's a picture on my ig page uh from years ago i mean i'm i'm one years old and i'm sitting on a saddle bronc saddle that belonged to you know a legendary saddle bronc rider named casey tibbs um from the from the from the 50s and 60s and and you know so literally from the time i was one year old till you know 10 years ago i was at a rodeo pretty much uh, every week i mean and then for for years i was at a rodeo almost every day so yeah it was so i just didn't really uh have those i wasn't looking for those opportunities to hunt either i was so focused on what i was doing as far as uh my rodeo career that i wasn't really looking for the and I met my wife and like her family all hunted and they were all like, why don't you go hunt? I'm like, I don't really see the point in it. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand. I don't see the point in it. I don't really, you know, I'm not, not sure I have time. And then uh, they finally invited me out to the deer camp. Uh, if you want me to tell you the first hunting experience, I'll tell you because it was, it was a dandy. Well, um, yeah, they took, me, they, they took me to the, they took me to the deer camp <laughs> And I, this is when we were dating, and I was positive they were going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they take me to the deer camp, and they give me a 12-gauge shotgun with a slug in it. We have rifle season here. Like, no one hunts with shotguns here. Mm -hmm. And they and, and her dad took me out in the woods, in the middle of this, in the middle of the woods. Like, I had no idea where I was. I just knew he just walked me out there in the dark. And all of a sudden, there was this big hole in the ground on top of this mound, and there was a yellow bucket in this hole. He's like, Sit on that bucket. <laughs> if one of the deer comes by, shoot it. <laughs> I'm like, all right. <laughs> so I, I had no idea where I was. I didn't know where camp was, nothing. He sent me out there in the dark. So it gets daylight. And also, you're talking about a dude that was a little bit scared of the dark, too, at the time. Like, I, was, <laughs> like, I, would, didn't, I wouldn't really, I always tell everybody, like, I'm not scared of the dark. I'm scared of what's in the dark. So, um, so like, they put me out there in the dark and I'm sitting in this hole in the dark waiting on a deer to come by. And, and all I hear is these dogs running and all of a sudden deer start running by me in the dark. And I'm like, and like they're getting three and four feet from me, you know, cause I'm in this hole in the ground. All that's sticking up is my head and uh, deer just going everywhere. And I'm like, I don't, it's too dark. Like I can't shoot now. So I just sit there and it gets daylight and it's silent. Like I don't see a deer for like three hours. <laughs> and I'm like, I hate this. Like I just get up and I thought I'm going to find my way back to camp. And I found my way back to camp and I went into camp and just sat there until they all came in and they're like, what happened? I'm like, I didn't enjoy that at all. Like I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, that was kind of my, my first day of hunting. And then, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's a story that, I, that I, I, I usually tell, but I probably won't tell it on the, on, on the podcast because it's a little bit incriminating <laughs> of my second experience in hunting. So uh, that was my first day of hunting and uh, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it. So I went right back to rodeo on it and I just forgot about hunting at that point. And, uh, uh, so what, what ended up getting you back into hunting then? I mean, uh, years, it was literally, man, probably 10 or 12 years later, um, uh, they actually took me out like later that same season and I shot I shot a couple does with, with a rifle and what, what it really turned on um, it just didn't seem like much of a challenge to me I mean I'm not I definitely don't doubt anybody to rifle, rifle hunting I'm not a good rifle hunter I think it's whatever any, any method anybody wants to hunt with that's legal is perfectly fine with me if that, if that turns you on that's cool um, it for a person that was, you know, challenging herself every day, you know, in, in rodeo and, and trying to be competitive, I had that real competitive drive and I didn't, I just didn't, didn't enjoy that part of it. It just didn't turn me on. So later I had a kid that was rodeoing with me that, that loved to bow hunt. And so we would be traveling, you know, for weeks at a time and during the summer and I'd be in the trailer playing in, in our living quarters trailer, you know, 
during the day when we had to do playing, you know, NCAA football, and he'd be standing outside the trailer shooting his bow at a, at a block, at a, you know, target, and still never interested me, you know. Um, and one one day we were somewhere, and uh, I don't even remember where we were at, but his something happened to his bow, and he's like, "Man, we got to go find a, uh, you know, an archery shop." And of course, then there were no nobody had cell phones or anything. You couldn't just Google it. You know, we had to drive around town find it, and. Uh, so we found this archery shop, went in, and uh, he was having his bow worked on, and there was a TV right up, you know, right up above the 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 tech the tech station there where they're working on the bow, and there were Drury films in there in the old VHS, and it was the old Drury films from like way back in the day, like you know, uh, they're really, I mean, back when they were when the Drurys were killing 130 inch deer they were like jumping up down about it you know <laughs> um and, and but they were showing you how they did it you know i mean they were this is how we set our tree stand up this is how you hunt a saddle this is how you hunt a funnel this is how you work the wind you know this is why we're hunting here this is you know i mean it was like so instructional and i'm like this looks really cool like this this interests me right that piqued your interest I'm like, this interests me because this is like, I have to work at this like really hard. Like there's there's a chess game going on here. And this, this really interests me. I literally bought a bow that day and set it up right there. And it was it was a, a it was an old Hoyt Havoc. And it was the last year that the Hoyts were still had a regular riser before they came out with that other riser. It was a Hoyt Havoc. And it was like, it was old. He was just like trying to get rid of it. And I'm blind in my right eye. So I couldn't, I mean, I shot right-handed in there and I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't see. So he had one left-handed bow in the whole shop was that Hoyt Havoc. And he sold me the whole setup. I don't remember what sites were on it or quiver or nothing. I did, he sold me the whole setup and a half dozen arrows and a pack of broadheads for like 380 bucks. And, uh, and gave me a few lessons. And um, that started me right there. Um, and I killed my first buck that that year with that bow. Mm -hmm. On 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 land that I scouted myself, I hung the stand myself, and I mean it was a deal, dude. I I bought everything I could buy. I was subscribed to every bow hunting magazine. I was buying every VHS tape of, that was out that was on bow hunting. Anything that had to do with bow hunting, whitetail deer, I was buying that tape. That that and I didn't. I don't, probably still have them somewhere around here, but. Um, and then I went and bought a book on whitetail deer. And it wasn't about hunting whitetail deer. It was about whitetail deer. Uh, and it, it was called um, Southern Whitetail Deer is all it was called. And all it was was just, you know, deer in the south, you know, what they eat, where they bed, you know, tendencies, antler growth. I mean, basically just said everything there was to know about a whitetail deer. And uh, I read that book cover to cover and then uh, started you know, reading stuff that Miles Keller was writing and like you know, a lot of people don't even remember who Miles Keller was, but like he was like the first guy to ever have like a record number of Pope and Young Bucks and killed most of them on public land, you know, and um, so I was a big Miles Keller fan and then when I actually got to meet him later on in life, you know, he's like so cool, you know, this guy was a mechanic or something, <laughs> he had the record for the most <laughs> Pope and Young Whitetail deer at one time, but that's kind of where it started. I don't know if that even got anywhere close to what we needed to say, but that's kind of where it started. Oh, I mean, that that's the beauty of doing podcasts and stuff like this. I mean, you know, it's like, it's just a long form, you know, so wherever it takes us, that's, that's where it takes yeah. us. And so it, it, that being said, like, so our listener base, you know, a lot of them are, you know, it, everybody wants to go out and kill big bucks and they want to, you know, but I mean, I, I, I'm the world's worst bow hunter, right? That's, that's my, my thing i you know if you can mess it up i've messed it up if you want to try it or buy it or whatever you know i'll i'll give it a whirl and so a lot of our listeners are right at that same point where they're either trying to kill their first deer with a bow they're trying to kill their first buck they're trying to take it to the next level um so it sounds like with your competitive nature with the rodeo and like like you were saying how it didn't challenge you and things like that and then when you saw it as a uh, I don't know, as a, as a puzzle that you could put together, you dove in head first. Now, do you think that like your personality style or whatever, you'd say that you go like 110%, like, you know, head first into this stuff? 
I did. I, I, I go, I go 110% anytime I try something new, you know what I mean? So anytime, like my very first elk hunt that I ever went on was do it yourself by myself, uh, over the counter tags, had no idea what I was doing and, uh, just went, spent eight days in a tent and tried to kill an elk. And, uh, but I went the same way about that. And, uh, I, I studied everything I could do. Obviously I, by that time, I kind of, had some friends that were really good elk hunters, you know, uh, the Jason Matt Zingers, Travis Stosta, some of those guys that I knew personally, Willie Schmidt. I was in Colorado, man. I was calling Willie or calling Trevin every day. Like, what do I do? Like, where do I, like, I'm not finding any elk. I was like calling anybody I could call trying to get information. Cause I was after the first couple of days, I was totally lost. But uh, the whitetail deal um, for me, getting to hunt several different States kind of really, and hunting a lot of public land to start with, because like I said, uh, we were talking before we got started. Arkansas is 45 days of uh, Arkansas is 45 days of rifle season. So the one good thing is is we have 3.1 million acres of public land in Arkansas. A lot of people don't realize that. Just about all that is available for hunting, and it's bow hunting only. Hmm. So Arkansas is a, Arkansas is a um, supplemental feeding state so you can feed here on private land cannot feed on public land you have to i mean it's got to be natural food sources so you're you know to me that was the next challenge you know once i once i got that first bow kill under my belt which was a really nice eight point on my buddy's farm he didn't bow hunt he just was like yeah man we just rifle hunt if you want to bow hunt you know before rifle season go see what you can do and literally my I went and hung the stands, hung two stands in the first stand I got in, the very first time I got in, and I, I killed that buck. And um, um, so from that, my next challenge was I wanted to do it. I didn't have bait out there. It was a natural food source then. It was straight up acorns that I was hunting over. Um, so the next next challenge after I, you know, hunted, you know, over supplemental feed around our deer camp and stuff, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to go other places and and experience other things so i bailed straight into the public land here in arkansas and uh, just started figuring out the puzzle and you know had some success killed a killed a few you know pretty nice little bucks that were you know not you know not giants or anything but just you know to me public land when you're hunting public land like that, I tell everybody they come down here to Arkansas. You're hunting public land, anything, and then and there's antler restrictions on our public land. Every every piece of public land is different. The one I hunt is uh, uh, 15 inches inside or an 18 inch main beam. So you know it's a pretty decent little little buck. Um, and uh, you know, so everything I've I've taken off of public land has all been, you know, I just tell them if it's if it's legal and it's in there you know that's your buck <laughs> yeah we do you know we don't have any we've got like point restrictions here and there and like that's one thing that trips me out talking to guys from the south because like i got a buddy in florida and he's like yeah it's got to be you know 14 inches or this and it's like how in the hell do you you know yeah. uh, you hold know, on stop let me mess your go Nope, you're not yeah, good. exactly. You know, and I the way I did tell everybody because I have people from other states that come down and hunt with me. You know, and, and uh, first place I want to take them is our public land because I love it here. I love our public land, and there are giants killed on our public land. I mean, every year there's right the, the public land I hunt. There's four or five bucks that'll be killed on that public land that'll all go you know one fifty or better. I mean, there's a really good deer, and um, about ten years ago one of the pieces I hunt borders is it's actually you have to boat in to get to it. If you watch the, the film home, that's on a, that, that a base map has a, uh, you have to boat in, you can't, there's no access to it. It's landlocked by private on one side and the river on the other side. So you can't get into it unless you boat. So I boat in there and uh, about 10 or 11 years ago, uh, one of the spots I hunt, it borders a private farm field and there's a guy that's got a big box stand on it that farms that field and he hunts it. And there was a 209 killed in the corner of that field right there, where I, right where I hunt. I mean, literally within 150 yards of one of my trees that I put a bow stand in every year. In fact, he had to get permission to go into the 
into the public land to to recover the deer because uh, he shot it with a rifle and uh, during rifle season. Two oh nine, three drop times. I've never never seen a. Everybody was telling me the deer had three drops, and I'm like, no way, no way, no way. And then I saw it, and I was like, holy crap, it had three drops. <laughs> that deer was, was a giant. So, you know, uh, main thing I just tell everybody is if if they come hunt with me, I'm like, listen, look, if he's out past his ears, he's probably at least met that 15 inch restriction. So if he's past his ears, you're, you're, you're you can consider yourself pretty safe. But I said, I, if you have any doubts at all, just don't. You know, I mean, that's just the best way to handle it. If I have a doubt, if I have to look and go, eh, eh, you know, nah, I'm just, I'll just pass. Uh, so, but that's kind of the, that's that's one of the deals with me. I love hunting public land, new challenges, or public land too, especially. Um, that's kind of one of my favorite favorite things to do is just find new places and go get after it. That's interesting. I mean. I would, I would guess, I want to talk to like how you transitioned, like from, you know, rodeo and then into to hunting and then all of a sudden, you know, in the industry and filming and, and doing all this stuff. But like on that note, like when you say that like public land is like one of your passions, it would seem like if you're going to film all of these exciting things and go, you know, that it would, it would be, you know, not as fun to go out on public and and you know actually have to work you know hard that's why, and, you know, that's do why that. i don't put out very many films <laughs> 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 exactly why i don't you know i've got a uh i've got i have a lease in kansas um and i've had that lease for 10 years and and one of the things i always said when i when i when i got that lease uh i've been hunting you know around arkansas forever and I'd get to go hunt a buddy's place here and there. And I always said, you know, I want to hunt Kansas. And Kansas just seemed like the place where there were just more mature bucks running around uh, than anywhere. I love the kind of terrain that was there, the, the, the way the land worked really coincided sided with my philosophy on, on bow hunting anyway, with what I'd kind of developed as my go-to methods on public land. Cause I like to speed scout and go in spots, you know, during the rut where I know I'm going to have these opportunities um, and Kansas kind of related to that plus the fact that I mean there were just these giants everywhere and you were just seeing more mature more mature deer and um, so I got that lease there and uh, I, I still have a ton of footage I probably got I don't even know I probably got a terabyte of footage from of stuff I've killed in Kansas I've never even made a film about just because it's just to me it's just not as exciting to, I mean my biggest bucks only two of my biggest bucks have I ever even made a film about I mean I, the, my biggest buck sitting on the floor right here he hasn't even been put on the wall yet <laughs> in my office and I have no one has ever seen that footage of me killing that buck I mean it's just I've never I've now filmed it there's 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 a film there but I've never produced it just because I'm like it's like, I feel like everybody sees that, you know, I feel like it's, uh, that's kind of, we'll get into that filming stuff later. You'll get to get into some of my pet peeves, which tend to piss people off a little bit, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, I like that challenge, you know, and it's like this year I took, you know, two rodeo buddies and another cameraman and we went to spend eight days in Northwest Nebraska on public land, chasing mule deer with bows. And, uh, and two and a half foot of snow, which is nothing for you guys, but for dudes from Arkansas and Oklahoma, <laughs> you know, it's uh we we pull up and there's two and a half foot of snow on the ground. And we have to shovel shovel snow to put our wall tents up, and and you know we had an either species tag, whitetail or mule deer, and we spent eight days. You know, I didn't even hunt; I just left my bow in the truck and towed the camera, and uh, and then I, I had another kid with me that's a really good cameraman that. It was his first, you know, backcountry hunting experience. So he was like all over it. And, uh, you know, we're putting that together. We didn't kill anything. We never dropped an arrow, but uh, it was so much fun that, that I'm putting the film together out of it. It'll be a short film, but it's, and uh, it's, it's going to be really cool. Uh, we saw 350 elk at one time, literally 100 yards from camp. Wow. And uh, I mean, uh, we saw tons of mule deer doe, uh, saw bighorn sheep. Uh, I don't know. We, 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 we quit counting turkey. I mean, we, we were seeing 
a hundred and 150 birds in one wad. You know what I mean? All the time we're like, we just quit count there. So yeah, I just think stuff like that's interesting. And to me, uh, when we get into the whitetail stuff, it's like, and I know this, this sounds bad from a guy that's kind of, you know, does this for a living, but it's like, how many times can we show this? It's, you can't change it. You can't, I can't show it any better than anybody else. Um, it's the same shot. It's just a different guy, you know, um, whether it's me sitting in a tree stand with a camera over my right shoulder or Michael Waddell sitting in a tree stand with a camera over his right shoulder. If I shoot 160 inch deer and he shoots 160 inch deer, it's all right. You know, how can, how do you, it's just, I, I guess I just decided at some point I still love the film and I never go anywhere without a camera. Yesterday's the first day I've been in a tree stand without a camera in years, but um, uh, it's just, I guess I'm looking for some new, uh, some new motivation to film some different experiences, different adventures to take people on. You know, it's like, uh, how many times can you see that guy, you know, the, the slow motion walk into the tree, climbing up the tree stand, the deer comes in, here he is, whack, there he goes, you know, uh, then the recovery. Um, and especially if it's on my lease in Kansas, it's like, well, you know, anybody can kill a big deer on my lease in Kansas. And I believe that fully. I believe I can put anybody on my lease in Kansas and they can kill a big deer, except one guy. We had one guy that he could never kill a big deer. <laughs> We we got that guy on our podcast. He uh my father in law, he went out to Nebraska last year and missed a booner out and he he missed uh, you know, came back to Michigan, missed missed a buck twice that when I was filming him and just exactly. and that that started the oh, deep little thing. slide. Big time. <laughs> well it you know it it just it it after ten years of, of Kansas and, and, and hunting some other spots and Kansas is still one of my favorite places to go hunt it fits my style it fits the style that I like to hunt because I you know I have a base kind of way that I hunt um hunt early season one way I hunt the rut one way and I hunt late season one way and um it's kind of developed this system that I stick to and it seemed to work and I'm not saying I'm the greatest bow hunter in the world. It just works for me. I'm confident in it. And Kansas, the way Kansas lays out, just really fits that. And, but that's how I learned on public land here was because we have a lot of big timber and everybody wants to flood to the big timber, um, you know, and go in these big, you know, 10,000 acre tracks and woods and, and try to find deer. And I'm looking for these, you know, 1800 acre tracks of woods that are public. So, so back to Arkansas, I mean, what is your, like the hunting pressure like there? I mean, for the, the amount of public land, is it, is there a lot of pressure? Like there, um, some of it there is, I mean, uh, a buddy of mine, Clay Newcomb, that he works for Meat Eater now, but he's, you guys may know Clay from Bear Hunting Magazine. So Clay, Clay gets on me all the time, makes fun of me all the time because I go to the, my, my public land down on the river because I can hunt funnels and food sources and that's how I hunt. He hunts the hills i mean he hunts public land in the mountains in the hill country of arkansas and it's hard like you you literally need to have spent a ton of time there um, to learn how to pattern deer and learn those food sources know where those bucks are going to be during the rut know where the does are going to be or where the deer are going to be early season and clay's lived there his whole life and he knows you know he's got that deal down and it's it's tough it's tough excuse me it's tough to hunt those those mountains and uh and it doesn't suit my style, so I just stay away from them. Um, and I don't have the time to put in, you know. I want to go enjoy, you know, my hunt still. So, and and now I'm kind of into other things too, you know. So, uh, uh, I think uh, the pressure there in those mountains is not as tough as the pressure where I hunt. Uh, there's a refuge down there where I hunt that has no antler restrictions on it, and you can drive uh, any kind of ATV or anything on it, and I'm you you can drive through there like i always take people down there and say hey this is the most famous refuge in arkansas for duck hunting and for well, not for duck hunting probably but for for whitetail hunting and you can duck hunt in the mornings too you drive through there and i mean there's just camper after camper after camper lined up down through there and then you're looking and there's everything from you know spikes to four points five points everything you can imagine hanging in the trees and you know uh and, and it gets hammered. I'm talking about it. Just gets it gets completely hammered. And even the walk-in area, 
of the part of the public land that I hunt gets hammered. But the part that I hunt where you have to take a bow, uh, I think in, in the 20 years I've been hunting that, that area, I think I've had maybe four people in 20 years that have come in where I was. I don't see anybody else. I rarely see a footprint. So it works pretty good. I like it. And, and it takes a little longer. I mean, it's one of those places, you know, you're not going to go in there and sit and see, you know, 20 deer every day. I mean, you may sit, I have seen 20 deer out of one stand in a day, you know, that we're all at the bow range. And then for the next three days, not see a deer. So, I mean, you know, it just, it's one of, it's one of those places you just got to put in the time and it's going to happen. So, but the pressure definitely is heavier on some spots. Um, and I don't know, I guess when I hunted the walk-in area before I started boating, I used that pressure to my advantage. I tried to, um, if everybody was going in deep, I would stay up toward the road. And if everybody was toward the road, I would in deep because I felt like wherever they were going to be pushing the deer the opposite way. <laughs> so I would just, I would just kind of play it that way. I wasn't very successful with that strategy but <laughs> so so how did you end up going from you know the kid in the hole to the guy in the outdoor industry <laughs> man that's a good question i get asked that a lot because i mean you guys know as well as i do you, especially once you, you you start doing stuff in the industry you have you know 20 guys come up and go hey i want to do what you do and how'd you get started and you know I, i've actually uh i've actually had people tell people that i was uh, Tim's an asshole. He won't tell you how he got started. And I'm like, well, I don't really know because it was a pure accident. I mean, total accident on my part. Um, when I retired from rodeo, I mean, I rodeoed for a living for 20, almost 27 years. I mean, that's how I made my primary living. That's how I paid my bills. And uh, when I got ready to retire, the last year I was competing, the last two months I competed, um, I had a torn meniscus and a torn MCL. And I was having to compete just because I had that many rodeos left to go. And like I said, that's how I paid my bills. And so I just toughed it out and, you know, competed. I won. I actually, I actually won a ton of money at the last rodeo I ever nodded my head at. Um, and I remember driving home that night, you know, and I was fixing to have to go through you know, about six months of rehab. And the only thing I was thinking about was, I'm fortunate that during this rehab that I'm going to have turkey season to look forward to because I was like, I got deer season and I, you know, I'll have a couple months and then I'll go into turkey season. So, you know, while I'm trying to figure this out, but uh, driving home that night, I remember I looked at my wife and I said, you know, I think after all these years, this is the first time I've ever actually thought that I want to look and see if there's anything else in the world I want to do besides this. Um, and she didn't believe me. She said, oh, you'll heal up and you'll be, you'll be, you'll be entering everywhere you nod your head at. And I'm like, well, maybe so. I don't know. But I said, I, def I think I definitely want to see what else is out there. And she said, well, you know, you've uh, never had a job and uh, you've never had to answer to anybody. She said, so I don't see you sitting in a desk anywhere. And she said, besides, what are you going to put on a resume that, you, you know, that you, you placed at Pendleton one year? Or so? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you placed at all these different rodeos. I mean, what are you going to put on a resume? And I'm like, well, nothing. I don't have anything to put on a resume. So uh, I said, the only th thing I like to do is bow hunt. Because at that time, man, it was like, I would have 30 days to bow hunt out of the year. I'd have 30 days, you know, pretty much, from the end of November through December. And then my first competition was always on January 1st, New Year's Eve um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it was a top 50 in the world invitational. So it was the 50 fastest cap ropers in the world competed there for like 50 grand. And it was an every year deal, and a huge deal. Wrangler put it on. And um, so, I mean, I, that was my first competition was right there January 1st. And I'd be bow hunting like all the way up till time. And finally, you know, one year my wife, I came, I came in from bow hunting and, she, and I set my, my bow case down and she said, let me see a case. And I'm like, what are you going to do with it? She said, don't worry. Just let me see your case, the bow case. And I said, all right. She grabbed it and she hid it from me because like I was a week out from having to compete against the. 49 fastest guys in the world and I had not picked up a rope in a month because I had been in a tree stand every morning and every afternoon 
and I was just I was just so engulfed in, in bow hunting at the time. Uh, so she literally had to make me stop hunting so I would practice to go compete so I could <laughs> win money. Um, and and that's kind of that's kind of where the outdoor industry thing started. She's I, I said you know maybe I can find something in hunting because bow hunting is the only other thing I like to do. I don't know what it's going to be. I was thinking I had no idea. Like I didn't know anything about production there was at the time you know there was no really there was no social media i mean i didn't know i didn't i never ran a camera i didn't know anything about any of it like there none of those thoughts were even in my mind i just knew that maybe there's an opportunity somewhere in the outdoor industry i didn't know what it was at all and um i bought a little plotter and i made some arrow wraps for my buddies because i was always customizing crap on my rodeo stuff like all my stuff was customized my saddles were custom. My rope cans were custom. My breast collars on my horse. Everything I had was custom. My bits were custom. Like I was just a customized guy. Like I wanted everything to be mine, personalized. And uh, so I did the same thing with bow hunting. Like all my, like I always wanted to, you know, wrap and fletch my own arrows. So, you know, I did all that. And then I thought, well, I, I don't like the wraps that are on there because anyone can have them. I want my personal wraps. So I, I bought a little plotter and, uh, and a little home computer and, and learned how to lay out wraps and I laid out some wraps and uh and I made them my, my own and I made them for my friends and then somehow or another one of my buddies posted them on Facebook and then I get a private message from Cameron Haynes and uh he said hey I really like those wraps I'm going on this is before he was you know million follower Cameron Haynes this was when he just had one or two videos on YouTube and and he was already an icon. Everybody knew who Cameron was back then. He just came out with the book, I think, at that point, Backcountry Bow Hunting. Um, and he said, I'm going on my very first brown bear hunt, and I want some cool wraps um, for my arrows to kind of commemorate it. Um, what would you charge me to make them? And I'm like, I didn't know who he was, but I kind of knew who he was. But, you know, so I was, I'll make you some. It's no big deal. I don't charge for them. I don't even know what, you know, what I would charge. So, I made a set of yellow wraps that had tiger straps on them and they said beast mode up the side and uh, his autograph photo that year for, for Hoyt, for Easton, for uh, everybody else he was working for at the time was that brown bear laying out of focus behind him in the snow. You've probably all seen it and he's holding up this bloody arrow and it's that wrap on there says beast mode and he's holding up that bloody arrow and that's all that's in focus is that beast mode on there. And next thing I know, like he's telling people and I'm making arrow wraps for like 30 television shows and half the outdoor industry <laughs> on a little plotter in my house. And uh, I'm like, maybe this is my business in the outdoor industry. Maybe this is it. I make custom arrow wraps for people. And so I started doing it. We came up with a, a cool logo uh, for Bad Medicine Archery and um uh, started selling some hats and t-shirts we were like one of the first ones that did that like no one did that no one had hats and t-shirts at the time I'm like we should make some cool swag to go with these you know so that's what we did and and no one had flat bills and like I always wore a flat bill hat my whole life I mean even before anybody else wore a flat bill hat like when I was a teenager and I'm old dude like I'm I'm, I'm old I'm 53 years old when I was in high school I would take my mom's iron and iron the bill flat on my hat just because I didn't want any curve in it and so we started making these flat bill hats with our logo on them and people went nuts over them. And um, I went to ATA that year and first time I'd ever been there and just met a lot of people on, I met probably, you know, two of my closest friends in the world now are uh, Jason Matzinger and, and Willie Schmidt. Um, they've become two of my closest friends in the world. And uh, uh, I met both those guys there that year uh, and, it started right there and I don't know how the film thing started really it just I bought a camera that year at Campbell's Tom Petrie suckered me into buying a camera at Campbell cameras um he didn't sucker me in I went in there and looked I didn't know what I was doing and he sold me something that was really easy to use I went to Kansas that year uh, with a GoPro and that camera and I had that was my first my lease in Kansas and I thought okay I'm just going to film everything like I have no idea what I'm doing but I'm going to film everything I end up staying for 21 straight days uh trying to kill one deer that I did not kill and I turned the camera on in the morning when I got up 
and I never turned the camera off till I went to bed at night. There was either a GoPro or my main camera was running on everything I did. And I uh, came home and I had no idea what I was going to do with all this footage. And a buddy of mine that I shot some archery tournaments with had just graduated from film school. He, uh, from uh, University of Arkansas film school. And he was over at the house and he said, we should make some kind of a film out of this. And I'm like, well, what would we do with it if we did? He goes, I don't know. Well, then Badlands announced the film festival very first one um uh, and he said maybe we can get it in that film festival and i'm like okay so we sat in my living room floor and edited the film that won the film festival oh shit about me hunting for 21 days not killing the deer <laughs> <laughs> and it it won the film festival so we uh you know it was pretty cool. That's kind of where it started. I thought, and, and he went to work. He was hired that night at the film festival for the production company that he still works for right now today. Um, and they produce tons of stuff. They hired him at the film festival. And then some reason or other people thought I knew what I was doing. So they started hiring me to film outdoor television until they realized that I had no idea what I was doing. Like I literally filmed all this, not knowing anything about what I was doing. And I thought, well, this is cool. I like this better than making arrow wraps. So uh, I, my first my first gig was filming for um, Wild Game Innovations. So do you uh, think that like that that like raw, fresh, like not knowing what you're doing um, is maybe maybe helped you? Um, people to look at it through a different eye because like what we talked about how it's everything is the same you know i think i think so and i think that's the deal is is one of the problems that that when we talk about filming one of the things that that yeah i mean it's just a, it's just a weird deal with me it's like uh um it all starts getting pretty vanilla you know if you watch i mean there, there's only so many slow-mo clips I want to see in a film. There's only so many overly dramatic bull crap I want to see in a film. There's only so many drone shots I want to see in a film. It's the same thing with photos. Like I would rather see photos that were real, like taken in the moment on a hunt, rather than staged photos, you know what I'm saying? Like those photos interest me because I'm like, you can tell that was taken while they were in the Sorry, my editing gear went off. Uh, while they were in the field, you know, it's like you can tell that photo was taken in the field. And, the, and, and, and also you could tell completely when that photo was staged. You know, I mean, you can look at it and say that was a completely staged photo, you know, straight up for this. This dude just needed some content. So he just went and shot some, you know, some straight up staged photos. And, and uh, you know, uh, I think that's I think that's a lot to do with the film. And I'm I'm. I'm not a technical guy, man. I mean, uh, uh, I even still today when, when I sit and edit and I've got a, a big editing machine here with four monitors and all kinds of crap. And, and, uh, I still, I'm, I'm a hunt and peck and try, it takes me forever to edit anything just because I get it all together. It all looks wonderful. And I, and I look at it and I think that's great. And I turn it off and I come back 30 minutes later and I look at it and I'm like, that looks like crap. And I had to delete it all. And I start all over, you know, it's like, uh, um, I don't know. It's like, I'm never satisfied, but I, I get caught between that wanting to really produce cool, you know, trendy type stuff, but I get caught between that wanting to produce that and stay just as plain as I can. You know, I mean, I guess, I guess where I want to go is, you know, somewhere between, you know, like the, like one of the one of the things that, that makes like the Hushin groups and people like that successful is that their stuff is so raw, you know, it's just really raw. And I think that makes so and they put out a ton of content. I can't do that. I had a company ask me to do a vlog. They said, We'll pay you if you'll do a vlog for us. And I'm like, on what? They're like, on you. And I'm like, I am not that interesting. I am not interesting enough to do a daily, a weekly vlog even. I mean, my life is just not that interesting now. Would have been cool when I was rodeoing, <laughs> you know, um, to do a weekly vlog or a daily vlog. But right, right now, my life is just not that interesting. And, um, uh, and I don't want to ever get to a point where I'm having to create things to make myself appear interesting. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I mean... Uh, 
I'll say, I, I feel like the same, like, so for us, like, I, I feel like the balance in, in, you know, like, like John, like I said, he's the, the bow guy, like his garage, like when we have videos and stuff that are in his garage, it's like covered in arrows and bow press and like all the stuff. And it's like, Hey man, you know, people, you know, we've got something coming up planned for the next year coming up to kind of show people like, you know, kind of teach people how to do some of the stuff, but it's like, you know, people are asking like, how do you do this or whatever, yeah. but it, it just hampers so much time. And then there's like that other balance of like, you know, it, it takes the fun out of it some ways. Like if you're, it always seems like you're doing something to produce content and it's like, yeah. we do this stuff anyways. I don't have to yeah like, take a picture of it. I don't know. <laughs> well, but that's the thing is that you, you're doing it anyways. And I think to me, that's, that's what sets it apart is, is for me personally, um, I know, you know, a few years ago, I had a company that they wanted to do this, this whole deal. It was actually the, the competitor company with them years ago um they said hey we're doing this we need you to write this blog called tips from the experts and i, I just was like man like i really feel weird about that like i feel weird about you calling me an expert on this subject because like i i i don't want to overstep my bounds you know what i mean i mean uh and it just really made me uncomfortable for them to make you know to have me write an article that was going to be you know under the heading of tips from the experts because i'm like <laughs> I, I don't feel like an expert you know um but here's the same thing as long as i've been bow hunting as long as i've been as long as i've been bow hunting uh 20 plus years i've learned how to do a lot of stuff on my own you know because i think you have to learn how to be able to you know fix a cable or, or fix something on your bow if you're if you're out in the hunt you know i mean something tears up if you got to be able to fix minor things. So that's kind of where I am. I can, I can tune up minor things, but man, the same guy still tunes my bow that's tuned it for 20 years. Like the same dude has tuned every bow I've had for 20 years. And, and I feel way more confident when I have him tune my bow because I walk in there, we set it up together. He knows how I want it set up. When I leave there, I know everything is square. So when I start sighting in, if I'm shooting bad, it's it's not because anything's off. It's because I'm I'm shooting bad. Um, so uh, just like bow tips, I have people all the time. They ask me about stuff, you know, bow tips and stuff, and I'm like, man, you know, I'm probably not the guy to ask about that because I I still have someone set up my bow. I can just tell you, you know, uh, this is what I use. This is why I use it. This is you know why why this works for me. That's all I can say. I mean, but, John, does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's the same with cameras. I get that all the time, too. Dude, like, I actually told a guy not long ago, he was like, well, he started rambling on about all these settings on my camera. And I'm like, dude, man, there's three knobs on this Sony, and I spin all three of them until it looks cool, and I hit record. <laughs> I can't tell you what any of those settings are. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, and besides, you know, unless you're, standing at exactly where I'm standing at that exact second, at that exact moment, with that exact temperature, with that exact sunset, with that exact lighting, it doesn't matter what the settings are because they're always different. Because, you know, it doesn't matter what your settings were in that particular clip because the settings were right for that particular moment. You know, I don't keep it on a standard setting. <laughs> but, uh but I'm the same way with, with my bow, you know, and it's like, this is my setup. This is how it works for me. And, and, uh, and that's pretty much the extent of my, I tell everybody, I mean, I shoot, I shoot for prime. I've been shooting for prime for three years. I shot for bear before that, but I tell everybody if they want to go buy a bow, I'm like, go to a shop. that has got the most options and shoot every bow on the rack, shoot yeah. every bow on the rack and pick the bow that fits you the best that you're the most comfortable with not the not the bow that you know somebody on tv told you to buy or the bow i'm telling you to buy go shoot every bow on the rack and i don't care what brand it is if that bow don't look at the price just shoot the bow whatever bow fits you the best that you're the most you feel like you're the most comfortable shooting that's your bow <laughs> 
You know, the best thing with people, I mean, a shop could do is just take all the bows and just spray paint them flat black so you couldn't see the name. Yep. You know, and of course, they'd prime them, though, because of the... And, but, it'd be hard to, it'd be hard <laughs> to have it prime, yeah. yeah. But just so people aren't looking at, you know, we say that same thing every time. It's like, what bow should I go to? Go to a shop that has as many as possible and just shoot every bow, and then you'll know which one feels the best in your hand. Yeah, exactly. I a, a, a guy that I hunted with, he re, he's a retired farmer. He's in his 70s. He never bow hunted. He wanted to bow hunt. But he'd shot a compound. Uh, he shot a crossbow a little bit, but he wanted a compound bow. So we went, and we went to my, my buddy's archery shop that set up every one of my bows, and he sells every brand. Like, there's not one brand. I mean, there's basically not anything in there you can't try, you know, of the major brands. And uh, at the time, I was shooting for bear. I don't even think Prime was even out yet. Maybe they just, maybe they were just making that G5 bow at the time. Uh, I can't remember. But um, uh, we set up everything. He literally shot. I, I can't remember which bear it was at the time, but it was my least favorite bear bow they ever made. Uh, Empire Bear Empire. It was a solo a single cam bow. It was their flagship bow that year, and I hated that bow with a passion. It, I never, it never tuned right. It never felt good to me. And I hated that bow. He shot that bow lights out. Like, but we had everything. We have Matthews, PSE, Hoyt, Bear, uh, Bowtech, everything he had in the shop. We had, we had set up a specific bow for him to shoot that we felt like he could handle at 74 years old. Now, 74 years old, he was a tough old dude, man. Like, I mean, he farmed his whole life. He wasn't beat up. He could hike you into the ground. I mean, that sucker <laughs> could walk. And and he was strong as an ox. And he shot that bow better than any bow. Either. And he bought some speed bow um, that Hoyt had come out with that year because it had bone collector on the front of it. He loved to watch bone collector. And he bought that bow. And I told him, I said, that's a six inch brace out bow, man. And I said, you just got to understand that bows, it's going to be tough. It's, it's not going to be very forgiving. It was only like 32 inches axle to axle, six inch brace heights for a dude that's just learning. I'm like, this is, it's going to be hard. And literally after uh, three months, he, he quit, quit, quit shooting the compound at all because he got to where he just couldn't shoot it. It was just too much for him. And he, he said, I should have listened to you, but that's, that's what I do with, with archery advice because I can't, I mean, I know what rest works for me. I know what sites work for me. I know what bow works for me, but, and people even say, yo, you, you shoot prime because they offered you something, man. When I shot for bear, bear used to have us go around you know, at ATA, me being left-handed, that's the only, not, I'm not left-handed, but I shoot left-handed because I'm blind in my right eye. Um, ATA was the only place I could shoot a lot of different bows because they were ever, you know, that's it. That's it Cause archery shops don't carry a ton of left-handed bows. So ATA bear would be like, you guys go around and shoot everybody's bow and come back and tell us, you know, who's got the best bow in the, in the building. And man, for a lot of years, Every year I came back, I shot every bow in the building. I came back and I said, Prime's got the best bow in the building. And they're like, what makes it better? And I said, I don't know. It felt like it was just felt better in my hand. It felt smoother to me. The valley felt better. I loved that hard wall on it. You know, it was just everything about it made me feel better, more comfortable. And uh, I was already hanging out with all the Prime guys. I mean, I was Jason Matzinger and Tim Burnett and, you know, Remy Warren, all those guys were all people I was hanging out with at ATA every year. So I was already like hanging out with the prime team already most of the time. And, and uh, so they literally asked me, you know, they said, uh, would you ever consider shooting prime and being on our team? And I'm like, yeah, but I said, I'm not going to leave Bear. You know, I've been there a long time and they've been really good to me. And, and you know, that's just loyalty means a lot to me. And so I, I, I never left Bear until things changed at bear rapidly in a matter of about a year and all of a sudden I didn't know anybody there anymore and I'm like hmm, maybe it's time for me time for me to change so uh so yeah I did I went but I can tell you right now like if uh I shoot for prime but that's the bow I would go buy if I went to go buy one tomorrow was out completely out of the industry and 
had no connections whatsoever and I'd been shooting prime, that's the bow I would shoot. So that's, I would go buy that bow and not even look at anything else. That would just be, that's just me personally. So, um, and that's the way I feel about all the stuff that, that the companies I work for. I mean, most of the companies I work for, I've been with for nine or 10 years and it's all stuff that if I wouldn't go buy it anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to mess with you. I'm, I don't want to mess with you. You know what I mean? If I, I'm not going to waste your time or my time or your money. Um, the same thing with base map, you know, when they approached me a couple of years ago um, about doing stuff with base map and Ed, Ed will tell you, uh, Ed Grams will tell you right up front. I told him, send me the app and let me use it. And if it's not better, I'm not, I'm not changing for any reason. And uh, he sent me the app and it was better. <laughs> and uh, I used it for a full season before I committed. So that's the way I've done with everything I've done in the outdoor industry. I've just found what I felt like I really liked the best. And, you know, this is what I would. And I just aligned myself with companies that I was already going to be using their product anyway. It didn't matter. So how'd you end up with uh, Badlands? I mean, it seems like, oh, yeah, you, you win the film festival and then now you're the MC. Like, yeah, that didn't really happen that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it helped me, you know, to get to know everybody really well. But uh, uh, I actually went on a hunt with, with, uh, with Jason, Matt Zinger, and Jason hooked me up with Sika. We actually went to Sika offices and, and I met everybody there. And, uh, loved everybody there. They were all super good people. And uh, uh, at the time, they had that really weird whitetail pattern. It was like a, they called it forest or something. It was like a weird blue green <laughs> looking. You, remember, you guys remember that? It was like a long time ago. They had that weird blue green looking. It had a lot of white, big white splotches in it. And uh, they said, hey, you know, we got this new pattern. We want you to try it out. And I hated it, hated, hated the pattern completely. And, and uh, I came back, told them I didn't like it. And I wasn't going to wear it. I was going to wear the open country <laughs> in the tree stand because I thought it, thought it blended better with the back cover. And um, uh, they said, well, you can't. You got to wear the whitetail pattern. And uh, I'm like, well, I'm not going to wear that because it doesn't work for me. And of course, since then, you know, I mean, they've revamped a lot of stuff at Sitka. I'm not jumping on Sitka for any reason at all. Don't think that no matter. I mean, that was their first attempt at a whitetail pattern. And it was really not good. <laughs> Considering the only color that a whitetail deer could see is blue. And when I was looking at that in a camera in the tree, it was blue. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, I can't use this at all. Um, well, they've changed everything now. I mean, they've got a lot of cool patterns and a lot, of, you know, Patterns work. I don't care, you know, the right patterns work. Everybody's camo clothes will work the way, but um, uh, a guy named Mike Miller, who's been with uh, uh, Badlands forever. He's, he's the OG pro staff guy at Badlands. He, you know, he's been on every Muzzy video back in the day and, and all that stuff. And he shoots a compound bow with no sights, no rest and fingers. And has killed everything from musk ox to whatever he's pretty much killed everything uh, i met mike and he said man i really like you you're a good dude i want to introduce you to the guy that owns badlands and i'm like oh cool i've got one of their packs you know i already had one of their packs and i liked it and he introduced me to bill the owner of badlands that year at ata and they were they just came out with the clothing line that year and uh bill's like uh well we'd, we'd like for you to use it wear our clothes and i'm like okay you know cool let, let me you know let's check them out and uh he said no we want you to like test them out for us tell us you know like field test them and like okay you know just let me know and i'll get on and order them or whatever you know and he's like no no i'm gonna give them to you i want you to test them tell us what you think and so i kind of freaked out you know and uh started right there with bill and then uh uh at the time the 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 marketing director that was there left that year um, and went to work at another outdoor company and they were kind of in between. So I mostly just dealt back and forth with Bill all year. And then they hired Blake um, who's there now. And uh, you know, Blake called me right off the bat. He said, you know, uh, I want to put a staff together and I want you to help me. And I'm like, cool, let's do it. 
And uh, so that's what we did. And number one thing we wanted to do was keep it small. And um, uh, the good thing about Badlands and the thing I love the most about Badlands is they listen to our input. If we tell them something's not working, they, they take our word for it. And they either improve it or just get rid of it. Um, or if we have improvements on any piece of, gar of, of clothing or any item, pack, whatever, if we have things we think need to be improved, I mean, they do it. But that's what our job is, you know, as a staff. And I think that's what most people don't realize uh, when, when you're part of a, like for us, there's only like six or seven of us that are on that official, what they call the official pro staff. There's only like six or seven of us that are on that. And to me, that's, that's part of your job. I mean, my job is to give honest recommendations over what I think works and doesn't work. And I think what happens is so many people are so excited about that they're on a pro staff that when they say, so what do you think about that jacket? Oh, it was the greatest jacket I ever wore in my life. And in reality, they froze to death in it, you know, and they're like, they're telling their buddies, man, don't get this jacket because you're going to freeze to death. But they're so afraid to, you know, to, to tell the people that they're working for that, you know, this jacket didn't work. Uh, it didn't cut the wind well enough. It didn't do this. And, you know, um, it, you know, literally I got cold uh, or I got wet or whatever. Um, and I think that's what we're here for. I think that's what we put together with our staff is we got a bunch of people that every year, beginning of the year, Badlands puts us on a conference call and we go through what we liked, what we didn't like. We go through what we want to improve. We go through what the new products are going to be, what we think we need. And, um, and they roll with it from there. And that's, that's what I really like about being with Badlands. And that's how I got on was with Bill, the owner. And uh, I've been there. He's retired now. He left. So like, <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still in Badlands. But, uh, One of the things I like about Badlands coming from like our perspective is the, like the warranty. And like, that's like a double-edged yes. sword kind of, because people look at a, you know, lifetime warranty and it's like from like, I don't know, Tommy boy or black sheep or whatever. It's like, you can guarantee a piece of shit, but you know, yeah. just send you another one. So yeah, like, you know, uh, but I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that's out there, you know, it didn't matter if I was in a suit and tie and there's a shed or something. I mean, yeah. I'll be out. I've ruined so many clothes because I don't pick and choose like, you know, when I'm going to go, you know, and, and it, like things get, get wrecked and ripped. And it's like, well, Badlands will just send you a new one. Like, it, yeah, it was and, like an and that's, that's the thing about that warranty is that warranty is not a safety net for them. That warranty is a safety net for you. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's, and it's, and it is a true 100% unconditional warranty. And if, and if they don't feel like they can warranty a product, they won't build it. You know what I'm saying? Um, they're just not going to build it. If it feels like it's something that's just, you know, not going to, that they're not going to be able to put that. If it's got that bullhead on it, it's got that, it's got that lifetime unconditional warranty on it. doesn't matter. Um, when I first started with a company, my buddy, one of my hunting buddies house burned down. He had an old 2200 pack. I mean, an old one. It still had the, the first camo on it. It was like the Vietnam looking camo, you know, it didn't have a, didn't even have like, uh, you know, mossy oak or real tree. It was just an old Vietnam pattern. And it was a 2200 pack. His house burnt and it melted that pack. That pack was probably 12 years old, 13 maybe. It melted that pack and all you could make out was a little bit of stitching that said Badlands on it. Like <laughs> It was just a glob. I said, well, let's see how good this warranty is. Just stick it in a box and tell them what happened and send it. Two weeks later, he got a brand new Realtree 2200 pack in the mail. And never mentioned my name, never said nothing. It was just, I said, don't say a word. Just send it in, tell them your house burnt. This was all that was left of your 2200 pack. And you understood maybe the warranty didn't cover this or whatever, you know, the house burning, but it was unconditional. You thought you'd try. They sent him a note back, personally written note. Sorry about your house, brother. Hope this helps. Brand new 2200 pack. Yeah, Man, I mean, I blew a zipper out on my Badlands fanny pack this weekend, actually. Yeah, the side, the side panel on zipper. the monster. I'm not. I'm not even sure what it is. It's not. It doesn't have the the. It doesn't have the shoulder straps. No, 
It's, it's the one that turns it's, it's into like, like a bucket. bucket, almost. Oh, okay. It's the it's the tree pack. Tree pack. Yeah, I bought it. What we're heading down to. We went to Ohio, right. like uh, 2014. Right. That, you, I don't know if they even make that tree pack anymore. So you, you probably just send it in and let them put a new. Uh, but they, this thing, you send it in. They put dude, a new zipper in. It? They put a brand new zipper in it for you. I oh, mean, sweet. that's that's the deal about the warranty. You know, the warranty is either they'll fix it or replace it. Um, mm. And it, there, there's a there's a lady there. God, I wish I could remember her name because I feel so disrespectful right now because I've been in the offices and. This this lady sits back there and she repairs all those packs. And when you walk in there, like she's got this big sewing station, <laughs> and like there's packs, you know, there that she's just putting new zippers in and you know maybe sewing new shoulder straps in or whatever. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing to watch that process there. And this woman has been there for a long time, like 20 years, and she's when she sent when they send them out, they're done. You know, I mean, they're finished. They're they're ready. They're ready to go back to the woods. But that that. That warranty is, you know, I actually told a store owner about that warranty one time about Badlands. You should carry Badlands because it's, you know, it's unconditionally warranty, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, no one does that. It's impossible. They won't do it. I said, it's completely unconditional lifetime warranty. He goes, I don't believe it. And I'm like, it is. And he said, I no, they, they couldn't stay in business if they did that. And I'm like, I've been here 20 plus years, you know, so. So yeah, the warranty's real, and that's one of the other reasons, you know, why Badlands has been you know, my mainstay company. I mean, I, uh, obviously, I'm pretty loyal to them. I don't know if you can see that on my own or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm kind of stuck to them forever, so they're stuck with me forever. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, that's one of the other reasons, because they're just such good people. I mean, if you call up there, there's only four or five people in that office. And you, whoever you talk to is going to be able to fix your problem. So with, you know, so, I mean, we've already been talking here for an hour and yeah. just kind of scratching the surface on all the stuff I want to talk about, but like, so with no ATA this year, a couple of things, like how are you coming out with like, not just Badlands, but any of the companies that you're dealing with? Cause I think you're like Rambo bikes and some of the other stuff. Like what are these companies doing? for their like showing off their new products and stuff. I know there's some like sort of digital ATA or something, but that isn't mm -hmm. as fun. <laughs> right? Yeah. I was looking to see if Blake had actually messaged me back on that, um, on the, on the, some the of the stuff festival. for ATA from them. But um, yeah, it's, it's different that it's going to be a lot different. And like for me, and I always tell everybody this, I mean, a lot of guys, especially in the position that I'm in, they're, you know, that do content creation or short films or, you know, and that's kind of my deal is mostly is it's not really about the film. I love the filmmaking part, man. That's my favorite part of all of it. But for the most part is most of the stuff you see for me is most of the stuff I do. You never actually even know maybe I did it because I mean, I shoot a lot of photo content. I shoot some video content here and there. Like we did that, that whole weird video for, uh, upwind this year <laughs> the you stink video um and and a lot of that stuff i'm i mean that's what i get paid to do is, is do content creation so um uh for me all the companies i work for i always have i mean all my stuff's pretty much set in stone when i before i ever get the ata and then i just get the ata and it seems like i'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off just trying to be able to hang out with everybody you know, because I want to see everybody. I mean, crap, you, we only kind of get to hang out once or twice a year, you know, and um, so it's just, you want to go to the booth and see all the new stuff. I mean, I'm like a, I'm just like a dealer when I go there. Like, I want to see everything. I want to hold it in my hand. I've been hearing about it and I want to actually touch it, feel it, see it. And, and so, and then I go around just like everybody else. I'll walk all the way through ATA and look at everything. And I have commitments, you know, for Badlands and for, you know, different, companies that I work for I have certain commitments that I have, have there especially Badlands with the film festival and everything but um, for the most part uh, the only thing for me is just, I'm going to miss the party you know that's <laughs> and I'm going to miss the, I'm going to miss the live you know film festival I mean that's one of my favorite that's my favorite part of ATA now is this film festival night I love going I love because I'll tell you right now I don't watch any of the films until 
I don't watch any of them till that night. The only ones I watch are my buddies. Like if I've got buddies that have got one that they've submitted, I mean, generally they'll send them to me early and say, hey, can you look? Because I don't have any, of the, I don't get to judge it. I mean, I don't get to pick the films at all. I have no idea what films get picked. I mean, people are like, oh, you work for Badlands, so your films get, you know, accepted every year. Hell no, man. I've had a couple of years that I've turned in some turds that I didn't, you know, like just trying to get something put together and the story just wasn't there and I tried to force it and it wasn't good. And I'd send it in a blade and go, here it is. It's just not good. <laughs> you know? I don't like it, but I mean, so yeah, I have to, I mean, my stuff has to get accepted just like everybody else's. And you know, some years it does, some years it doesn't. Um, but you know, like some of my buddies, when they finish one, they'll send it to me and say, what do you think? You know? And, and, uh, and I'll watch it and I give them honest advice of what I think. And they do the same thing for me, but that's the only ones I normally see. Like I don't, I normally only see one or two of them beforehand just because we're all friends and like they see mine too. I send them mine too, you know? So we just critique each other's work basically before, you know, what could I improve here? Should I take this out? You know, Jason Mazinger one year, uh, he did a, his film was, no voiceover and no music through the whole film. It was an L cutting film. I don't know if you guys remember that or not. Yeah, I think we did. And, and he mm -hmm. sent it to me. And I think it won the film festival that year. It might have won second. I can't remember. He sent it to me. No, that was a year. That might have been the year born and raised when it. Um, he sent that to me. It was the first time he'd ever done a film with no voiceover or, or music. And he was like, it just seems weird to me because like there's no voiceover music to it. He said, what do you think? And I'm like, dude, I think it's the best film you ever, it's your best film. Cause hearing him interact with the camera guy, hearing what he was hearing in nature, hearing the birds, you know, hearing the outdoor sounds, the winds, the wind. And, you know, I think it was Sam was filming for him at the time, maybe. And he was talking back and forth to Sam, you know, about where this elk was. And to me, that was so real because I hunt with a camera guy or I hunt with a camera a lot, you know, and it, to me, that's real. That's, I hate hunting. When I was filming outdoor TV, I hated the fact that the camera guy had to, that you just had to pretend like you weren't there, period. Yeah. It's obvious someone is filming this dude, you know, and he's just talking to the camera like he's talking to the audience and the camera guy just had to sit there and shut up the whole time. So anybody time guys film with me on film projects, I'm like, just know like you're, if you're if you, you guys are talking like i'm going to use it so just talk if you guys are having a conversation i want to hear that conversation you know if, if when we were in nebraska the kid that was filming for me out there daniel i'm like if you and cash are talking back and forth about what your next play is don't turn the camera off keep it rolling i want to hear that i want that in the film i want that interaction because that's real right mm -hmm. it would be cash turning around the camera going well, I think I'm going to go over this next ridge. I'm just not sure. Um, instead, it was, you know, Cash going, I think we should go over this next ridge. What do you think, Daniel? And Daniel was like, I don't, I don't think we should. You know, it's like, you know it's like, I, I want that banter because I want it to be real because that's just like two dudes that were hunting would be talking to each other, you know, and right. I just think that's real. So, yeah. Um, I know one of the things you guys got, got to ask, to ask about on this was about the film festival and submitting films and what we're looking for. I can tell you that we can get into that a little bit. If you want, if you want to talk about that, if we have time. Yeah. I mean, it's your time too, man. So yeah, I'm, I'm but, here, man. Like I literally drove in straight in from deer camp and walked, walked in and got my computer set up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. That's one of the questions I get asked a lot too, is, is, you know, what, what are you looking for as far as a Badlands Film Festival film? And and uh, I think story is number one. If you don't have a good story, it's it doesn't matter. I don't care. I don't care how how good you shot it. I don't care how beautifully it's shot. If you don't have a good story to go with it, you know it's story's king. Um, it needs to show in the film that there's some meaning to it to you. You know, to the person that's in it. If it's if it doesn't, if, if, I, if I can't get that feeling from you, like this hunt meant something to me or this story meant something to me. A few years ago, someone submitted a film and I can't remember who it was. Um, 
and I still don't know the guy's name, but I think it won third. And it was all about he built his own trad boat. And it, he filmed the entire process from from cutting the tree, cutting the tree down that he built it out of to, I mean, the entire process. And then at the end, he doesn't even kill anything with it. It just shows him going out to hunt. And then that's how the film ended. And it won third. And it's an audience vote. And I remember thinking, that was cool because that that meant something to that dude. I mean, that guy spent all that time, not only through the process of building his own trad bow that was shootable, you know, a, a long bow, but then he f- took the time to film it all, right. the whole process. I mean, who would have that kind of patience, you know what I mean? <laughs> So, you know, it's the same thing. It's, 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 a, uh, and then a lot of times we have people that, uh, we have a lot of people that try to, you know, they'll, they'll try to make up a story to go with some great footage in it. And then they wonder why, you know, they, they might make it into the film festival if they don't get very many votes. It's because that comes through, man. It shows, it, it resonates with the audience. I mean, a, a really good story, um, you know, either make someone want to go there and do so now that we're back uh yeah what what we're looking for is story i mean story's king and and uh obviously we want you know high quality footage and we want you to you know we want it to be produced well but you know the story is always king if uh if there's not a good story there it's just not you know it's not gonna it might make it into the film festival, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna resonate. So. Can, can we uh, like talk about that a little bit? Like that's the hardest thing I think for for me and maybe for like most guys, because there's you know you can go into um, and again we're going to be talking mostly to you know a public land guy or a guy that's you know you know not. Uh, professional here so but but you can have all the hopes and dreams in in the world you know you can you can want you know when I think of story I think of like you know uh filming you know guys want to film a specific buck or they want to go on this elk hunt you know for some reason or for some purpose right um rather than like you said like getting some footage and then trying to wrap a story around it you know because there's got to be the beginning middle and the end so you have to have all of that put together um what do you do if you've got a story and then like in, in your case there the first year uh you don't kill something or you never thought it was going to happen you're filming and then you do kill something and then you're like oh shit how do well, what do i do now yeah it's uh it's tough i mean it's uh it's 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 tough uh like I said, if you just, if it's, you have to, you have to become, almost become addicted to having that camera with you, you know, I mean, it's like me, it's so, there's times that I want to go, just like yesterday, it was easy for me not to go with the camera because it was pouring straight down, I'm talking about torrential downpour, I only had a couple hours to hunt yesterday afternoon, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to go, climbing a tree, no camera, no nothing. I thought today will be the day the biggest mountain lion in Arkansas jumps out of a tree and kills like 12 deer in front of me and I won't be able to document it. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what I'm most afraid of is not carrying the camera. Something cool is going to happen and I'm going to miss it and not be able to prove it. (laughs) (laughs) So I think you just have to become addicted to that camera, man. You have to like it. You know I mean? I think there's a lot of people out there that I don't know. Here's, here's one of the things I kind of live by. Like if, if you're only making content because you're getting paid to make content then your content's not going to be as good as a guy that's passionate about what he's doing. You know what I mean? Uh, if you're only making a film because, you know, you think it's going to further your career somehow, um, your film's not going to resonate with people as well as a guy that was just, you know, uh, like my buddy Lane Walter, you know, with his mom on that sheep hunt, you know, when she was fighting terminal cancer at the time, you know, and she killed, she went on that sheep hunt with her, with archery gear and she's a world-class archer too, you know? So, you know, that film won the film festival that year. That film resonated with people because everybody was thinking, you know, man, if that was my mom, you know, uh, 
or, or man, how cool is that that Lane did that for his mom? So, you know, uh, to me, and I think that's why the I have kind of that pet peeve about stage photos and we have to do so many i mean i have some i have stage photos because i've got companies that require so much content you know or they need this or they need that and you know they count on me to go do it and that's what i get paid to do but at the same time man i tell all of them up front i would love to i try to get as many photos in the moment as i can you know while we're actually in the middle of a hunt i, I try to get as much at that moment as i can because uh, i want it to look real and i don't want it to look like we staged it and same thing with video uh I shoot for for an eleven minute film. Let's say I'll probably use ten to twelve percent of the actual footage that I shot. It's a two, two hours. Film. Two yeah. hours of footage or so. Yeah, or more. You know, so less. You know, it's just. Uh, but if you don't have the button pushed, it didn't happen. That's just the way I look at it. <laughs> if you don't have it pushed, it didn't happen. So I, I just record everything. And, and that's one of the problems I ran into with outdoor TV was uh, the first time I, I went and filmed for uh, Wild Game Innovations, I sent them back a, now I don't even know how much, probably a terabyte of footage from a three day, four day hunt. And, uh, and their, their, their production guy was like, he called me and like, cussed me, like literally just cussed me on the phone. Like never send me this much footage. And he literally sent me guidelines of what they wanted for their show. And it was, we want, uh, we want a, a little B roll of where you are. We want the host saying where you are and what you're doing. We want, the animal coming in, we want the kill shot. We want five cutaways of products. That's it. I'm like, okay. I mean, all right. So at that point, that's when I realized like I wasn't made, cut out for, for this. Now, I mean, outdoor TVs, there's a lot of shows out there that are a lot different than that. Obviously, Jason's and Willie's and, you know, some other shows are produced highly, really well. They're more storytelling shows, you know, now. Uh, those type of shows then were like, they weren't as many kill shots in them as they could get, and that was what their focus was on. Um, but, like, for me, I just, I film way more. I feel like I want to overshoot and then pick out what I need. But I want to overshoot it because I don't want to have to go back and think, man, I wish I'd shot that. So, uh, like, from from that perspective and, like, um, you know, obviously when you shoot that much, and, I mean, we ran into this, and that's why John's turkey video is coming out this turkey season. It's analysis by or paralysis by analysis or whatever. I mean, we don't know what we're doing. Like, we're not excellent. But we shot – he shot this turkey on seven cameras. Like, we had it freaking awesome. Like, I mean, we, we've got so much video for this freaking turkey hunt. Like it's ridiculous. It'll never come out. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sitting here with this, like you talk about, I got a terabyte of footage just on one turkey kill. Like, yeah. like you know, and, and then it would yeah. lasted like a half hour, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so for guys that are, that are starting out, like you know you 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 made it very clear at the beginning you know it was one camera that was easy to use and and a gopro um you know because guys especially now in this day and age with with social media and youtube and all of these tutorials and all of these you know yeah. oh you can try this and you know everything's a, a sony a7 whatever and it's yeah you know, five grand just to get set up and but that by the time you save up the money to get it you're into the next model of camera and etc um how, how do you temper that with that like you said coming from the 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 tv show where everybody sees this and they think they need to get that cutaway of the broad head and they need to get you know all, all of the same things every single time it's you know that's that's the thing. And that's, that's a, that's a double edged sword. You know I mean? That's such a double edged sword is that I think, and that's one of the things we do talk about at the film festival is, 
you know, when you have a, when you have a guy submit a film or a girl submit a film and it's, you know, it's the, the first, you know, all the way through it, all it is is cutaways to her product shots, you know, or, or his product shots. I'm not trying to call anybody out. It's his or her product shots or, um, uh, of their sponsors. It's like obvious you're calling out your sponsors. This is not an infomercial. This is a film. If you want to subtly show a broadhead in a, you know, something, there's a time and place you can do all that subtly and, and it works. But if you do it continuously, then you're just a NASCAR driver, basically standing outside your car saying, you know, boy, the old, you know, uh, you know, Tampex 2000 was a good car today, you know, and <laughs> it really ran smooth on that SDP oil, you know, and I'll tell you, it's, you know, I mean, otherwise that's all you're doing, you know, and, and we don't want that. We don't want that. We want, and, and, and anyone who watches the film festival or goes to it knows, I mean, we're, we're equal opportunity outdoors. We don't care what camo you have on. We don't care what bow you shoot. We don't give a crap. So long as you send in a good story, we're here to promote the outdoors and the hunting lifestyle. That's what we're doing. That's what we want the films to do. We don't care what camo you wear. We don't care what pack you wear. We don't care what bow you shoot. We just want a good story. We want people to set and, and be touched by that story. So, you know, it, it's line, you know what I mean? It seems like there's always those little cuts to, and there's a time and place for them. Show to, to show. I mean, look, yeah, this is, but this is my bow. But obviously, if I'm standing there, I'm walking through a field, and it's pretty obvious what camo I've got on. I don't have to, you know, zoom in on the bullhead. Uh, if you if you can if you're a, I shoot prime. If you're a judge of any bow at all, it's pretty damn easy to figure out what bow that is. You know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to zoom in on everything. You know what I'm saying? It's like, there it is. I remember in the home film, I did say specifically that I killed that buck specifically thanks to the, to the fast Eddie from spot hog. I did say that. And I didn't say spot hog. I just said the old fast Eddie. If it hadn't been for the fast Eddie, I'd have never shot that buck. And it was the absolute truth because that site is a single pin site, you know, movable site but it's got what, what I call the oh shit pin right, <laughs> right in the center. So that's exactly 15 yards from this pin. <laughs> and that buck was coming in and I was, and I was sitting shooting with my first pin and all of a sudden he moves out and I'm like, oh shit. And I just put, the, I put that second pin on him and drilled him. But if I hadn't had that, I would have never killed him because I didn't have time to dial in. I'd have probably aimed higher and shot over his back or something but I had the oh shit pen and there it was. it was. I'm sorry. I'm saying that so many times, but it was like, right. I mean, I'd smoked him. It was perfect. And I'm like, I wouldn't have killed that buck. had I not have that. And that's the only time you'll really ever hear me say anything about a product on there because I was truly like impressed that I'd shot that pin and I killed that buck. So, but yeah, I think there's just a fine line there. Um, if, if you want to promote your, if you want to promote your sponsors, make videos specifically for that sponsor, send it to them. They'll be happy. That's just all I tell people, you know, if you, if, you know, just like base map, the home video for base map. Um, I mean, you saw we were using base map a couple times in there, but we didn't beat anybody over the head with it. You know, I mean, it's a base map film. It says it's from base map at the beginning. Obviously I used base map. <laughs> You know, it says base map at the beginning. Uh, I don't have to pound you over the head with the map. You know, there's a couple of clips in there where we were actually looking at the map. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't pound anybody over the head with it. It's obvious at the beginning of the film, it's a base map film. Obviously I use base map to scout these places, you know? So um, I just think when you learn how to do that subtle, subtly, you know, it's a better deal. Um, some people do a really good job of it. Some people don't. I'm not a big fan of interviews. I catch a lot of flack about that. The sit downs, you know, where I don't like, I don't like doing them. I don't, I don't like putting them in films. I don't like, I'd rather see, hear some voiceover rather than see someone do a sit down and explain, you know what I mean? Does that yeah, make sense? Oh yeah. Uh, well, like I told you before, when we were on the phone, like 
you know, we talked to Caleb and he just eats, you know, Caleb from the redneck tech podcast. He yeah. just eats up every single film that's in badlands. Cause you know, they're all the same. They're all this, the, you know, in the guys yep. that are out there, you know, making good stuff are too busy working. They don't have time to put a, a, a good film in there, you know? So well, Caleb's, <laughs> Caleb's a great dude. I mean, I've been on Caleb's podcast. He has me on there before the film festival every year. And uh, Caleb's one of the best in the business, but you know, I mean, I tell him every year, put something together. <laughs> Put something so, yeah. together. But yeah, I mean, it makes sense, you know, because, you know, I, I, and like I said, like, I think, like I said to you, and I think, you know, I've, I've said it on the podcast before, you know, after you talk to somebody like that and they kind of tell you what they don't like now, all of a sudden uh, you don't have a fresh eye and you're saying, Oh, oh yep. There, there's what he said. And there's that. And, yep. you know, it, it kind of detracts from like what you're watching. So, you know, to be, yeah, to be, we were sitting at the film last year. I was like, Oh, yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> Both of us were like, <laughs> yeah. But, like we yeah. we don't even put out films and we're jaded. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. It's like I mean, there you you can you can definitely get jaded, and and I get jaded too. But I'm jaded over TV and 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 egos and content. I mean, that's the whole thing with me, and that's that's one of the things that probably gets me in the most trouble in the outdoor industry is because. I come from a, I come from a place where, you know, you actually had to prove who you were and, and, and you couldn't hide it. I mean, when you nodded your head, when you backed up in that corner and nodded your head to run that cap, what ability and confidence you had shine for, for 50,000 people to see and all your peers and everybody else. And they knew right up front, you were either real or you weren't. And it didn't matter if you had a little ego or it, to be honest with you, we all have, we all had a lot of ego in the rodeo. I mean, you had to, it's a singular sport. Uh, we definitely believed we could fight a bear and win on any given day. And, uh, but we were all buddies. We, you know, even if we didn't like each other that much, we pulled for each other. We tried to help each other if we needed to. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things that, that gets me in trouble in this industry is there's a lot of egos from people that, you know, don't necessarily need to have them. That's what kind of, they haven't proved anything to me. You know, I mean, I haven't seen anything and I'm not talking about Caleb, by the way, Caleb, great. Caleb's awesome at what he does. Um, I'm just talking about people in general. It's like, uh, I don't need, I don't need hunting or filmmaking or anything to prove to anybody who I am as a person, you know, or even prove to myself. And I think that's one of the things is that so many people try to use it as a, as a self-worth crutch. You know what I'm saying? It's like my self-worth is based on how many people like me in, or, or, you know, who I'm hanging out with or what company I'm representing or whatever. And I just, you know, I'm not, I'm not about that. And that's, um, that is one of the things that I, that I see out there that, um, that kind of messes, that kind of messes the whole apple cart up for everybody. I don't, I'm trying, I'm trying to mince my words without being too harsh. Can you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think stop, stop being so impressed when, when everyone stops being so impressed with their self, and looks and sees what we're actually doing to the industry. Right. Mm -hmm. They'll understand a little more. But the problem is, is most of them don't want to become less impressed with themselves. They want to become more impressed with themselves. And, uh, and that turns people off to what we're trying to do. You know, I mean, I work with a game and fish here a lot. Uh, three years ago, they told me that Arkansas was down 160,000 licenses and licenses hunting licenses from the previous like five years 160,000 people that didn't buy a hunting license that had bought it previously there's something wrong there you know what i'm saying um and i think that's the same thing with what we're doing with these films and with outdoor tv and stuff i think when we start portraying it as something that it's not or trying to make it bigger than what it really is then we're taking the you know the whole experience away from the everyday guy because uh 
your average bow hunter's experience is not going and sitting in a stand and, and, and deciding, you know, whether he wants to shoot the 140 or the 160. Right. That's yeah. not his reality. His reality is probably sitting somewhere where he might see three or four does or the same four or five does every day. <laughs> and, you know, uh, he's fortunate if he sees a 120 inch buck and he kills it and then he comes home and he's all, he's all excited about it. And then he gets, you know, smack shamed on social media when he posts his picture on Facebook um, because, you know, it wasn't big enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and but it's that because is- we, because we, as, as, as creators of all this content, we we've built up this huge false narrative, you know, about you have to be this expert archer and you have to be this uh, expert physical fitness person. You have to be this expert on all this to be a hunter. Um, you, you don't. And just like in the seminars that I, that I used to do for Bass Pro all the time, the most asked question was how do you consistently kill mature bucks? move somewhere where mature bucks live where big ones live if you want to kill giant bucks every year move somewhere where you have to hunt where they live if they don't live where you live you're not going to kill them they're just <laughs> not there it helps to be a farmer in iowa a lot <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think that that's what like opened you know the whole reason that we did this podcast is like at the yeah. time when we started it just wasn't represented you know people that were like struggling <laughs> like yeah so, like like for for us to even like go out on public land and shoot a buck that you know that's decent or whatever and then or and then kill one on film like self filming and it's just like mm-hmm. and it's a huge accomplishment you know absolutely for, for myself and you know guys you know I think they that resonates with them in in that same way where it's it's you know last year I killed a a spike it was a little four point with brow t- or you know spike with brow tines the first deer that i ever self-filmed killed the whole works posted on social media people were like thank you for posting that yeah because you know you guys have a podcast and all this stuff and it's like uh i'm proud of myself like what i did you know i don't care what people think i'm whatever <laughs> that, that you're exactly right but that's the thing it's like and that's one of the reasons why i haven't posted some of the the kansas stuff is because it's you know I don't, I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I have to get in some kind of an ego contest with anybody about what I killed. I don't even score my deer. Like the only reason I know the score on any of my deer is because my taxidermist is a, is a, an official score. And he says, you want to know the score? And I'm like, no. And he always writes the score down on my tag whenever. I, that's the only reason I know why any deer I ever killed score because I don't want to know. I just, I mean, I know he's big. I don't care. You know what I mean, it's like, uh, I'd love to tell you that the 180 inch deer that's not on the wall, that's laying on the floor. I'd love to tell you there was this huge, magnificent story about me having seven years of trail camera pictures of him. And his name was Jeff. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, Jeff came in and I hunted, you know, I tried, tried to kill him for five weeks. And all of a sudden one day I just changed spots, you know, and made it all this really cool story. And then he came in and I shot him didn't happen that way. I've never seen Jeff before in my life. Jeff was not, I, I didn't even check a trail camera. It was the opening day of bow season in Kansas. And I climbed up in a tree on a transition area and Jeff walked under my stand and I shot him at 26 yards. Literally there's a minute and 56 seconds worth of all the footage of the whole deal. <laughs> That's it. That's the fantastic story of Jeff or whatever his name is. His name, I don't name dear, but it's, <laughs> we'll call him Jeff just for fun. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's, it's true. I think, I think there's just one of the problems that I get in with, with the outdoor industry is, is the ego problem is like, everybody thinks they're, you know, their self-worth is, is, is tied strictly to, to, you know, being known as the, the great hunter and, you know, just, just be who you are, man. You know, just do your thing and do it the best you can every day. If you want to film, film. If you don't want to film, don't film. It doesn't matter. Go hunt. Go have fun. Buy tags. Buy your license. Get into bow hunting. Teach your kids. Take your kids squirrel hunting. Who gives a crap? It doesn't matter. Just get outside. It doesn't matter if you film it. If you enjoy watching outdoor TV and that's where you get your jollies, watch it. But just know that's not reality. It's not reality. It's no one's reality except those guys. I mean, 
and, and I'll defend some of them because I had a guy one time told me on public land, he goes, oh, you put Michael Waddell or Nick Munch down here in our public land, see, see if they can kill a big, one of them big bucks down here. And I said, I know both of them. And you give either one of those guys a month down here, they'll both kill a giant. They're both great hunters. They, they, they were great hunters before the television show. I said, they hunt where they hunt now because TV requires it. They don't have the time to go put in a month on one piece of public land to chase one deer. They have 26 episodes to produce. That's a lot of content. Yeah, I don't think people like ever, the other side of that is I don't think people realize that either. You know, yeah. that it, that it is, you know, on, on some level, it, just like we were talking about getting jaded on like whatever we're seeing, like for some degree in the way that it works is they are required to produce, you know, yeah. said content and, you know, to do that, you'd have to, it, it kind of goes back to that whole storytelling thing. You would really have to have something that you were seriously chasing to engage somebody for 26 episodes of not killing anything. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to have a really big Jeff. I mean, no one wants to watch anyone hunt on public land in Arkansas for 26 episodes. I can promise you that. So, I don't care who you are. It's, it's no fun. You know, um, but it, it is what it is. And that, and outdoor TV is what it is. And that's just like Caleb, Caleb, Caleb's great at what he does. Like Caleb's one of the, best videographers best best producers and and him and ryer and, and then the whole group they have together they're they're great at what they do absolutely great and they would put together a absolutely great film no doubt whatsoever have no doubt whatsoever but you know like you said it's you got to take time to do it and you know matt zinger's a pretty good filmmaker obviously so you know there's a lot of that but you know everybody's got their own style and everybody's got their own deal and and all i'll say to caleb is i hope he watches this he probably will since i'm on here is, <laughs> is uh um make one send it in i would be excited to see caleb's film because he he does such good work i would love to see that film so what's the status of the film festival this year since there's you know not an ata like we like we were talking about so it's going to be online. We're actually going to do a live stream of the film festival. Um, all Blake would tell me is uh, where you're going to actually be able to watch. It's to be determined as of right now, but it is going to be February 5th and we're going to be Blake and I will be hosting it from the studio. You will still be able to vote, but what we're going to do is we're going to cut the voting down to a shorter period of time. So I think last in the other years, you have five minutes everybody to vote but that's going to cram the you know with it being online that's going to just completely wipe everything out so i think what we're going to do is we're going to drop it down to you know i think like a two minute vote and that'll keep it from just you know overwhelming the system but it is going to be live streamed you're still going to be able to see it uh, we're going to give away some prizes and stuff on there we're going to pick some different people you know throughout the deal and still give away some stuff um and will you know, there be anyone throwing trail cameras <laughs> there will be no one throwing trail cameras man that was a I I, you brought that, up. <laughs> that dude almost got fired over that man i was like whoa i was like don't do that <laughs> i think i even said over the microphone what are you doing yeah i think that was exactly it <clears throat> I'm like, what are you doing so is, yeah. the, is the public going to be able to watch it? Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be live stream. So everyone's going to be able to watch it. The, the voting is going to be live. So you'll be able to watch the vote just like always. And, and uh, once we cut it off, we'll pick the winners and, and uh, we'll mail them their prizes, I guess. <laughs> I don't know when there's their money and their prizes. So, uh, uh, but we still have a lot of, we still have a lot of sponsors. All the sponsors are involved. You know, obviously there's no free beer. I was just going to say, where, who's, how do we get this free beer this year? No one, no one gets free beer. So uh, that's going to be kind of a bummer, but uh, yeah, we still have all the sponsors and stuff involved and the live stream is going to be good. I'm not sure where they're going to live stream it. We had, we, we knocked around about three different ideals of, of where to live stream it. Um, 
and it's still going to be a free event. So I don't, it's not going to be like a pay-per-view or anything. So uh, as far as I know, it's not, unless they've changed it, but that's not something I think Badlands would do or consider doing. So uh, it's, but yeah, I, I, everybody, I guess is this, the submissions were due by the 14th, but I think he actually might have extended it a little bit because we moved it out to February 5th. I'm probably going to have my arm in a sling because I'm having surgery in January. So, uh, but I will be on stage with Blake in in Salt Lake. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna shoot do it all live from the studio in Salt Lake. Well, so do you think? Um, because I mean, we've been there, but generally it's not available really to the public i mean you have to go and you have to have a ticket it's free mm -hmm. and the tickets are given away at ata now it's going to be available for oh. the for the public to to see do you think that things might change going forward to continue live streaming it to the public uh after this year yeah we actually we actually had some of that in the, in the works for this year for a live stream um, and the reason we did was because not last year, but year before last, um, I got hired to go do a live switch, which was on, um, and it was at the world English shooting competition in Chicago, Illinois. So it was, a uh, all the best trap shooters in the world, um, in the world everywhere. I mean, the team Russia, all the Olympic teams were all there. Everybody was there. And. I was part of a crew that got hired to live switch that. So we were literally just live switching it just like TV from four different camera angles onto Facebook as it was happening. And they had a host with a microphone, the whole deal. And when I came back from that, saw how easy that was to do and that they were, we were getting 30 and 40 and 50,000 viewers on every live switch and we did that for five days and and the in the place we were live switching it to only had two thousand followers on their instagram on their on their <laughs> facebook page and we were getting 30 and forty thousand people watching that live Whoa. i was like that's crazy I, I told blake i said we need to do this the only thing we were going to do with the with the live switch if we continue to do it is there will be no live voting so the only voting will still be in-house Right. But people will. So what we're going to do is while the voting is going on, the people that are watching it are going to watch commercials. <laughs> <laughs> and then when the voting's over, we come back and tell them, you know, the voting's going on, but they won't be able to vote. Okay. Otherwise, it's just it's just not fair. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just not fair. I think it just needs to be an in-house vote. You know, this year we're obviously going to have to do it that way, but where everybody in the world can vote, but we're we're going to, you know, drop the time limit down to where you haven't got like, you know, people sending out the number to like 5,000 people that aren't even watching the film festival and everybody's just voting, you know, so uh, you don't have time to do it. Cool. Well, I, like I said, when we get back and, and from ATA, that's, what, we get a lot of questions about like, you know, how was the film festival this year? How do you see it? Or, you know, where do we do that? And it's like, you know, it's such a cool thing, but it is sort of a bummer that the public doesn't get to be involved just just as much because it ends up kind of feeling like just for the industry type type thing. And is that um, like how it was designed from the beginning or I mean, how did it evolve to that? Yeah, really, it was Blake's baby. I mean, Blake came up with this idea. He wanted to do something um, that would be a really cool event. Um, to promote hunting. I mean, that was the whole deal with Blake was he said, I want to do a really cool event that, you know, we can later put on our, on our YouTube channel for everyone to see, but I want to do a film festival. Like the other, not, not, you know, full draw has been around for a little while. Um, and it's a great film festival, great touring film festival. Um, but there was nothing at ATA, no event like this at ATA. We were trying to figure out something cool we could do, you know, through Badlands at ATA and Blake's, a, you know, film festival. And, I'm a big fan of like all the, the outdoor film festivals, like, uh, that aren't hunting related. Like I love to watch, like, if you, if you haven't ever watched like that Jimmy Chin film free solo, like that's an awesome documentary. Like, um, uh, I love watching stuff like that. In fact, I watch very little out hunting films. I watch 99% of the stuff I watch are 
from filmmakers outside of our industry, you know, rock climbing or climbing Everest or surfing or skateboarding or whatever. I just love watching those other genres, I think, uh, more than anything. But there wasn't really anything like that for us. So thus the Badlands Film Festival was born. And unfortunately, the year I won it, it didn't pay any money. <laughs> I just got a trophy. I mean, I look at the trophy every day. I'm like, you should send me a check. Just... <laughs> but um, uh, but look at the doors that opened up for you. Oh, right. absolutely, yeah. man. The the it did. I I can say this 100. percent And Jason will tell you. Jason Mattinger will tell you right up front. You know, it's uh, it's super important for him to have a good film every year and have it in the film festival because if you're in the outdoor industry and this is what you do for work, it's um you're you're in you're in front of everybody in the industry basically right there you know i mean they're all there all your peers are there it's become the go-to thing now at ata i mean we we run out of tickets every year and it's packed you know i mean pretty much as packed as we're allowed to, to put it so uh, and to hear people sit out there and cheer for the films you know when somebody makes a good shot somebody makes a bad shot they ooh, somebody you know something happens everybody's you, they, you, you hear the emotion you can tell what films are getting to people you know because you can hear the emotion during the film you hear it you know yeah especially when you walk out to get a beer and it's like you hear a big oh. old cheer and it's like oh what did i miss yeah what did i miss you know and, and i can tell you right now like um uh my favorite my favorite moment ever at the film festival was henry the kid that that was uh that couldn't walk mm -hmm. you know what i'm talking about yep that was and dad so, carried him around john yep. yeah yeah so what's crazy is brian salison that's his nephew brian salison from beyond rubicon um brian salison i knew i knew brian you know kind of just from ata hey how are you i had no idea that was his nephew and um that night they put that film together and and it won the film festival and when that little boy ran down that aisle and i picked him up on my shoulders and he held that check up i thought this is the coolest moment <laughs> this is like the coolest moment ever you know um that kid we were just watching him he couldn't walk at all like it was never expected to walk and then he had this experimental operation that allowed him to walk and then it allowed him to run through rehab and then he reruns a a, a, a a little junior high marathon and wins it and then now he walks and he comes running down the aisle to get his check for winning the film festival and i thought that was the coolest moment ever and i met his parents and i met you know brian's parents through all that and we're all still really good friends and and to me, that was just, and, and the reason they said it was because there's, there's a picture of me, like I'm literally bawling while the kids on my shoulders, like I was literally tears coming. I couldn't stop. And I was like, and they were like, we just saw that emotion on your face. And like, you, we could tell, like it really resonated with you. And it was, it was just a crazy night, you know? Um, so you get to have those kind of moments there at the film festival, you know, that was the first time I ever saw a standing ovation for a film, for one of our films. And I remember, I mean, how do you not give that kid a standing ovation? That's what hunting's about, man. I mean, that's what that's what we should be promoting. We should be promoting the feel good stuff. And it didn't matter if that kid killed a spike or a two hundred inch mule deer. It didn't make a crap to me one way or another. The fact that the kid was out there, his dad was carrying him around on an ox pack, mm -hmm. on an ox pack frame, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. For him, so he could so he could mule deer hunt. And, you know, and, and then to go from that to being able to walk and go out and do it on his own, that's what it's all about. I don't care. I don't, I don't really don't care. I don't care how big a, I don't care how big a deer any of our so-called celebrities kill in this world. Nothing's going to compare to that kid right there as far as I'm concerned. Not one thing they're ever going to do is going to make them bigger than that kid. Yeah, it was, I mean, every year there seems to be like one of those powerful stories and you know that that certainly was you know an iconic moment you know i mean when the you got the mc up there crying and the, the whole <laughs> the whole place is going nuts i mean it's, yeah, it's crazy it's something so 
I guess like through all of that and the, the film festival and, and everything for guys that are just starting out filming, like not on a level of where they're going to produce a, you know, and, and maybe they will, maybe they'll, they'll go the, the Tim route and they'll grab themselves a GoPro and a, a handy cam and they'll create a, a, a film, but you know, so what tips do you have for the guys just, just starting, you know, if you had like, say, three tips for the self filmer or the, the new guy starting out that wants to film his dad or his buddy or his whatever. Film, film everything, but be really careful what you put out. Because here's the thing that I think this is the most important thing I can tell anyone who's just starting. When you put it out on social media, I don't care if you have a hundred followers or a hundred thousand followers when you put it out on social media you're representing all of us all of us as hunters so just be mindful of what you put out um but film it all you know film everything that goes on during the hunt i and as far as budget goes for cameras man you can go buy a sony handy cam for like 199 bucks right mm-hmm I think and that's, that's what John had. Could, yeah. And there is literally, I, I still use that 90% of the time for my, for my POV camera. Like if I've got it in the tree, it's like, I've got my main camera and the camera that's usually facing me or facing, you know, if I'm filming someone else, the camera I have on them, like for an above shot or a side shot or whatever for a POV shot is generally nine times out of 10. It's that it's a Sony handy camera. <laughs> Um, so you don't have to spend thousands of dollars. Don't jump right into the DSLRs right off the bat. Um, Sony Handycam, uh, the Canon, I think it's a called a Vivia Vixia 10 or 20. Um, if you had to go to a camcorder style camera, that would be the one I would go to next. That's what I started with. And I'm telling you right now, I still wish I had it because that sunbuck was bomb proof and super easy to use. And I love just flipping that screen open and pushing record. <laughs> Auto focus was rolling. And the color was the same every time. You didn't have to worry about nothing. It's like, yeah, this is perfect. I still wish I had that camera sometimes. And uh, uh, But yeah, you don't. And, and there's so many places you can go learn. Golly, so many places. And on on YouTube and everywhere, there's so many tutorials you can go learn from or go to, you know, Tom Petrie and those guys have a film school. You can go to that thing. Uh, they have a couple different schools throughout the year. Um, if you're really into it, you know, do, do just like you do with your deer hunting or anything else. If it's, if it's that important to you, learn everything you can learn about it, you know, and that's uh, just don't, you don't stop learning. That's for sure. And, uh, I mean, I still to this day I watch. I mean, I, I'm 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 the least technical guy in the world. I mean, so I watch everything. I I watch YouTube tutorials almost on a daily basis. I'll be interested in something and I'll find a tutorial on it. So yeah, just and film everything. You know. Now we'll get into your your bow setup here in a minute, but um, just because you are like the one of the badlands guys and we don't usually ask about like gear or anything like that but what's the one piece of gear that you you know as far as like if someone from badlands or or whatever like what's the one piece of gear that you like you know put your your stamp on that this is this is the one my go-to it's all good, but the one piece that I never leave, there, there's, there's one thing I never leave home without, no matter what I take on a trip, which, um, I mean, the one thing I never leave home without is the XO rain suit. <laughs> never leave home without that. That's the, it's the best rain suit on any market. I don't care if you can compare it to North Face, Patagonia, any, any company that makes rain gear at all, you can compare that rain suit to, to any of that. And, and I use it for a lot of stuff like in, in spring and turkey season when the ground's still wet there's a lot of dew on the ground it's still na- you know nasty damp out uh, that's what I wear I wear my XO rain suit hmm. because don't get my butt wet and um, uh, and it keeps the dew off of me in the, and uh, a couple years ago 
and we were still trying to develop our our warm gear and we hadn't developed it yet because we were experimenting with all this fleece stuff um uh we all about froze to death because we we hadn't perfected that pyre you know the new pyre gear for super cold weather uh, and we didn't have anything that was we either had super cold or or not warm enough you know I mean, it was kind of right in that right in that center so with what we had that year while we were developing the cold gear um i put that rain suit on over my next to skin and then i put my fleece on over it i was toasty warm man everybody was freezing i was hunting you know 15 20 mile an hour winds and in kansas and it was you know 16 17 degrees and that wind wasn't blowing through that rain suit it was good so you know i mean that's my favorite gear it's my go-to piece like i take the xo rain suit everywhere i go so how does that don't you have a new set of rain gear out the bale rain gear like what's the difference between the two because this is this is not um staged or anything like that but through our like through our patreons and all of that one of the things that um they because i said you know we do quarterly giveaways and i'm like well what are you you guys reluctant to spend money on and one of the main things was like nobody wants to spend money on rain gear but they all want it so we're going to give away a set of that i was going to give away a set of the bale bale, rain gear, but i don't know what's great the bell's great but here's the difference like I wear the, the I wear the bell, um, I mean I wear the the EXO as my actual clothes that I have on. Like that's what I wear. Like even if it's just damp, the bell is made. You can pull it over your existing gear, whatever you have on. It's super packable, which the EXO is too. But this is made for you just to put straight on over what you have on already in the field. Like just pull it on, and you're good to go. So if you're out hunting, I mean, that's what the bell, that's what the bell rain gear was, was designed for, was for you to be able to throw it on right in the field, um, right over what you have on. It's super lightweight, like the XO and everything, but it, it's looser. It's a little looser fit. So it fits over your clothes a lot better. But the cool thing about both of them is they're both kind of the same material and they're super quiet. I have both. Okay. I haven't had the opportunity to use the bell yet. Like I said, yesterday it was pouring down rain, like it was pouring. And literally I just put on uh, the the variant hoodie, the new mutton, mutton top. I had that on and I had the bottoms on and then I just put my rain suit on over it and that was it, it's all I had on. And uh, it was perfect. So, um, but yeah, the bell, the bell's definitely made, it's, it's a great rain gear, but it's made for like, super easy for you like to unzip the legs and, and literally just pull it on over your if you got rubber boots on or whatever just unzip the legs pull it on zip them back down same thing with the jacket and everything's made just to go right over what you have on already okay super quiet too like that's the thing about our rain gear super super quiet like most rain gear is not quiet this rain gear is like really quiet the guy was hunting with me in arkansas a couple of weeks ago it was raining uh he was from a, he had a competitor's brand on uh, that he was representing and he was talking about how great the rain gear was. And I'm like, man, that stuff is way too loud for the white tail woods, dude. That stuff is loud, you know? And he's like, yeah, but it stops the rain. And I'm like, yeah, but mine stops the rain and it's quiet. You know? so, <laughs> anyway, that's, that's my go-to gear. Cool. Speaking of gear, I always ask the question about what's your bow equipment obviously you are having some issues and you went to trad this year but why don't you break down both of like your compound and your trad for us okay so uh, my compound bow which it's kind of, kind of a weird dude because being blind in my in my right eye i'm not right i'm not left-handed but i have to shoot a bow left-handed because i can't see through the peep sight with my right eye so i had i mean fortunately i'd never shot a bow when i had when I had a right eye, so I started out shooting left-handed. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, for that, that that that's going to make the story sound kind of weird of when I switch over to the trad bow. But um, this the the bow I have, I don't have the new Nexus yet, but I will have the new Nexus whenever it's from from uh, Prime. 
and I like to shoot a little longer axle to axle bow. I'm not really into the short bows. I mean, um, to me, I've always thought, you know, there's a reason why competition bows are so long is because they're more <laughs> forgiving. And, and, uh, I figure if I can keep a little more length in there that I'm going to be more accurate. And, um, and so, uh, the bow that I have out there now is the, the, the black series and it's the five, it's a CT five. So it's, a uh, uh 35 inches axle to axle 72 pounds i think is what it ended up being when because i maxed my bows out because i just always felt like not because i want to be super superman or anything it's just a long time ago i had a bow manufacturer tell me that bows were designed to perform at their best when they were maxed out pound yep. poundage wise and and with a heavier arrow they'll, they'll always perform their best with a little more weighted air in, in the arrow or just match your spine the best you can you know mm -hmm. um so um, it's the Black Series CT5 is what I'm shooting, uh, 72 pounds, stokerized stasis stabilizer. Um, I like the stasis because I shoot a, I keep my quiver on all the time. I used to shoot a two piece all the time. Uh, G5 and, and uh, Prime doesn't make a two piece quivers, but I still don't take my quiver off ever. I keep my quiver on all the time. And I like that stasis because it's out on the side and it's got that sidebar built off mm -hmm. of it, but it's up where it's supposed to be. It's up by your hand. So it's, it's balancing out that having those six arrows, you know, parked on that other side. Um, I'm a big fan of the spot hog fast daddy. That's what I shoot. Um, I love that. I love that sight. I love uh, how easy it sights in the adjustability of it. I like for a white tail guy, most guys want pin sights. I, I got target panic years ago. Um, when I first quit rodeo and started shooting tournaments, um, I developed target panic and I found out that going to that one pin site really helped eliminate a lot of that target panic. Uh, so I like, you know, being able to dial that side in plus on the fast eddy, like I said earlier, you have the Oh shit pin. So <laughs> you gotta, you know, it's, it's it's got a yellow dot on the top it's got a green dot in the center and that's exactly 15 more yards so you got that no matter where you are you don't have to readjust um vapor trail gen 7 rest um i'd never shot a limb driven rest before didn't really didn't really know how well i would like shooting a limb driven rest i you know i felt like there were some you know some options for for a limb driven rest to actually fail you know better than it being on the cable uh, but it changed my shooting. Like I, I can tell you, I had a company that I wasn't even representing at all that I paid full price for the rest. And it was one of the best rests on the market that you could buy anywhere. And I still think it is, but I changed from that rest and I bought that first vapor trail gen seven because everybody was talking about it. I bought it at a tack event at a total archery challenge and uh, ears actually put it on for me at vapor trail he put the he put it on there for me and i sided it in and i'm telling you it made a huge difference in my shooting because i'm i have crappy form i'll tell you that right now i can i mean my form's crappy most guys that look at me they're like man your form's like really crappy but you you know you don't have any trouble hitting the tin ring you know so <laughs> i'm like yeah don't mess with it uh, so the vapor trail gen 7 and uh i shoot victory vap tkos have for years probably 10 years now um and as far as my broadhead set up for years i wouldn't shoot anything mechanical at all and then a uh, year before last when g5 came out with the dead meats they told me they wanted me to try them and i'm like i was super reluctant to try them at all uh just not a big mechanical broadhead fan um and they wanted me to try them and matt zinger tried them that same year and killed the elk and a mule deer and the whitetail and a bear and everything with it and an antelope and i'm like man if you're killing all that with it i'm gonna try it so i tried it and uh, that's what i've been shooting for broadhead ever since so that's pretty much that boat set up uh trad bow is a little different definitely a humbling experience um i uh when i found out that I wasn't going to be able to shoot my compound this year because I literally tore three of the four tendons that make up your rotator cuff. 
Uh, I tore three of those four tendons completely in half. Uh, I decided this last summer I was going to go back and rope and rodeo a little bit with some buddies. And I hadn't roped in 10 years. And I went one day and I roped, ran about four calves. And that was it. Tore the rotator cuff completely. And um, so uh, I can't physically hold the bow up. Like I can't hold the bow up at all. Uh, with my right hand because shooting left-handed that puts the bow in my right hand and I the tendon that runs behind your bicep which is what allows you to pick everything up it tore and retracted up to here so they don't even know if they're going to be able to repair it um so had to go to had to go to trad and the reason I went to trad people were like well if you can't hold the bow up then how did you even go to trad but when I shoot fish or when we bow fish and shoot instinctively, I shoot right-handed. I can't hit anything left-handed. I mean, I've tried to shoot fish left-handed. I cannot I cannot hit a fish left-handed. But I can pick up a right-handed bow and shoot instinctively and shoot fish all night. So I thought, maybe I can do the same thing because I can, with back tension, because you're shooting a trad bow, you shoot, you're using so much back tension, I don't have to worry about this shoulder. I just really have to worry about the back tension part of it and just keep my fingers on the string and get the form down. So there's a guy that lives here in Arkansas named Ricky Welch. I don't know. Most trad people will know who Ricky Welch is. He's, you know, uh, I think a seven time IBO world champion, traditional shooter, seven time ASA traditional shooter. He's won like the world traditional shoot in Oklahoma a couple times. Uh, and he lives like an hour from my house, and I didn't even know him. I just kind of had heard of him. But he, he owns a company called Dakota Custom Recurves, and he gives lessons. Like, that's what he does for a living. Like, he sells Dakota Custom Recurve bows, and and he gives lessons to people on how to shoot a trad bow. And I called him, and he let me come over, and I shot several different bows in his house. And the bow that I shot the best was his actual hunting bow, the bow he hunted with. And uh, he said, you're shooting this bow the best. And and uh, I said, well, you think I'm going to be able to do this? Because it wasn't hurting my shoulder very bad to, you know, to pull that back and get anchored. It was really, really not bad at all, as long as I just concentrated on back tension. And, um, man, within a couple of hours, he had me shooting, you know, a group about like that at 20 yards just because he just – he, he just taught me he's such a great teacher he just showed me form and exactly what to do and he talked me through it and he put a bow in my hand that fit me and then I said this is it make me one and every bow he makes is completely custom you can't just walk in there and get one off the shelf so it took a few weeks and, and uh and then uh then I got a custom recurve and I went over and shot with him again for a day and I've been hunting with it ever since and uh yes, yesterday afternoon I missed missed my first doe as the first shot opportunity I've had the whole time with it and shot right over her back should have shot out of the tree stand a little more <laughs> but it's a humbling experience so I'm shooting a, a guy I can't even remember how long it is the recurve that I'm shooting is really long um, and it's uh, it's 40 it's 48 pounds on a 29 inch draw length does that make sense mm -hmm. so um uh, and it's 63 inches, maybe tip, tip so with, cool. uh, with about an eight inch brace height. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> what are your arrows and broadheads with that setup? So still shooting VAPs with it. Um, but I'm shooting, uh, dirt nap, the dirt nap trans. Yeah, I can't think of what they're. I can't think of what the name of those were. I bought them. I just I had a buddy of mine was shooting them. Well, my buddy Mike Miller was shooting them out of his compound, you know, with shooting fingers, no sights, and everything. And he'd been killing everything with them. He loved them, and I'm like, well, I looked at them. I thought they they look pretty cool. Let's uh let's try those. And uh, so that's that's the broadhead I'm shooting. And I'm still shooting Victory VAPs, and it was kind of a crazy because. Uh, when I was talking to Ricky, when I got down there to shoot Ricky's bows, that's what he shoots is VAPs. And I'm like, you're like the only trad person I ever saw that was shooting like victory VAPs. And he's like, I've been shooting these things forever, man. He said, these suckers got a punch. He said, 
you need more punch with these trad bows. He said, you're not pulling as much kinetic energy. He said, he said that big broadhead and that little bitty arrow with all that weight behind it, you know, he said, it cuts that big hole and that little arrow just pushes right on through there. And I'm like, that's what I've been trying to tell people. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I think my whole setup, I think my whole arrow setup's about 480 grains. Okay. So, and I shoot, and I shoot fingers. I don't shoot a tab. I shoot a glove and I shoot three under. So, and I'm, and I'm pretty slick at 20 yards. I mean, you give me 20, 25 yards. It's, I mean, I can, I can handle it. It's obviously not from a tree stand yet, apparently, but, uh, <laughs> But I'm shooting pretty good after that. But it's so humbling to know that, like, I have a range behind my house for my compound bow that's, I mean, there's 17 targets on this range. You can stand in one spot and you can shoot from where the bow hang, from where the bow rack is. You can shoot out to 96 yards. And now, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited if I can, I can smoke, if I, if I shoot a group like that at 20 with the trad bow, I'm like, oh man, I smoked that. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just super humbling to, to know that, that that's your range now. It's crazy. That's cool. So uh, are you going to be like, has it, has it changed your you know, like thought process as far as the compound? Or, you know, cause, cause they, they, you know, they say that with trad, you have to shoot it every day. You have to do all that. And so are you, when you're after your shoulder surgery and you're healed up, are you just hanging it up and it's a, it's a wall hanger or. Oh no, I'm going to, I'm, I'm shooting it. I mean, but it's, it's definitely, I mean, I'm still going to shoot the compound. I mean, there's just too many. I still love shooting the compound bow. I mean, I love, I love shooting the compound bow this has definitely been a challenge. I mean, and I'm, and I'm up to it and I want to kill some stuff with it. Like there's definitely going to be some specific trad bow hunts. Like, like when I'm hunting Arkansas for sure, like I'm probably only hunting with the trad bow. Um, and I definitely want to go to the lease in Kansas and, and, and kill one of those giants with the trad bow. I mean, can you imagine, <laughs> can you imagine saying you killed 160, 70 inch deer with a trad bow? Like, I'm just like, I can't even imagine that. Like that, that would probably be like, I don't know that I'll, I, I told my wife after this buck that's sitting here on the floor, I said, I'm probably not going to mount anything else for a long time just because it's like, I, I, first of all, I'm running out of room in my office. And second of all, it's like, uh, I mean, that was like the pinnacle. I never thought in my lifetime I'd ever kill a 180 inch deer, period. And now I'm looking at him and I'm like, okay, so what's next? But now it's like, like 130 inch deer with a trad bow is probably getting mounted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I shoot, there there was a buck that was on my game camera at the at the at the deer camp that I swear to God he's probably three and a half years old and he might he might be ninety inches, but he's legal. If he came in, he was getting an arrow. I mean, I was flinging one at him. It was like it was. I think I said it on my story yesterday when I was walking in. It's pouring down rain. I got the trad bow, no camera. If it's brown, it's down. It's all happening. <laughs> Oh, uh, so you mentioned your story, you know, as we wrap this up, where can people follow along with all the things that you're doing? And I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of stuff. So uh, the best, best place to follow me is on my Instagram page. I post mostly on there. I don't, I'm not on Facebook very often at all, but my stuff usually goes over to my Facebook page, which is just Tim Inslee. And, and it's just a private page. I mean, it's not private. It's just a personal page. So it only as about if you try to if you try to friend me and i don't friend you back like i'm at the max on friends i think there's like five thousand that you can have on like your personal page and like it won't let me it won't let me set any more friend requests on there uh but on my um on my instagram page is the best place to find me tim underscore insley e-n-d-s-l-e-y uh dot wild horse but usually if you just put in Tim underscore Inslee, it comes up pretty quick. So that's the best place to find me. And then there's a lot of video on Badlands on the Badlands YouTube channel. So you can go on there and uh, subscribe to that YouTube channel. Most of my videos on there, and obviously base maps got a lot, got some video um, on carbon TV, I think. And um, yeah. Oh, well, awesome. I mean, sure. it's been, it's been a good one. This is it's been fun. So I just want to pre, you know say we appreciate your time and. Uh, well, I hope I didn't ramble too much. Oh no, you're you're good, man. So. <laughs> At least you didn't have to pull it all out of me. <laughs>